Tommy, how are you doing? How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'll see you, Dimitri. It is good to see you, my friend. I hope you're doing well today. Um, we are talking about how Javier is gradually erasing parts from the sen sentences of Lacan. So he's making lack part of Lacan. It's really, really beautiful that he's been doing. And I really enjoyed that reflection uh, that you put forth. Uh, to the man, you know, it is funny the difference, though, between speaking and writing as different mediums and where you get certain excesses or not in, in things like that. So it, it's quite curious. Um, so thank you for that reflection. No, I'm doing well. I So we have decided we're going to try to release Belonging again next month as opposed to June because we're idiots. So we're going to try to be blitzing through that as quickly as possible. So we will see. It was started in 2016 uh, and has kept going through versions of versions and kept growing and growing um, with being a sociological examination of, say, Berger, Philip Reith, uh, Conyers, and different people. Because I really feel like the sociologists um, are missing from the conversation. There's a lot of talk about, you know, a lot of people talk about economics, jobs, so on and so forth. But we really don't have a good... Um, Analysis, analysis of society as psychotechnology. And a lot of those thinkers are going to be following up with Freud, like in Civilization and Discontents, um, and really be arguing that you can't understand human actions purely in terms of, say, economic modeling. You know, when a burger is writing, they're like, oh, we can understand humans and what they do purely in terms of incentive structures, right? Economic incentives. And there's that great book that came out called uh, What's Wrong with Kansas, where all these Democrats are like, why in the world does Kansas always vote um, uh, Republican? You know, because Democrats are going to give them unemployment benefits. You know, we look, we're the class of the working people. Uh, we want to give them better hours. So why do they keep voting Republican, which seems to be the, um, you know, the party of big corporation, uh, big money interest, and so on and so forth. And there are some people at the American um, Enterprise Institute, Mr. Brooks, who always argues, well, the problem is the Democratic analysis back then really fails to take into account how people's culture and ethical systems is a big, big role in how they think the way they do. So simply for a lot of people in Kansas, it's merely immoral to take money from somebody and give it to someone else, where redistribution is immoral. And so even if it would interest them, they're like, no, we're not going to do that because we don't believe in government as an agent of social change, right? So the idea of that analysis is that if you leave out culture, if you give me that broad term, from your understanding of how people act, you end up getting very problematic um, analysis of how people act. Now, one of the reasons this book was started because I was reading all those sociologists and then, you know, Trump was elected, which shocked everyone. You know, how in the world did Trump get elected in 2016? Well, it, it completely fit in with all these sociologists because you were, you were not taking people's culture into account. Their sense of belonging in the nation that they are in. And so someone like Trump, who's like kind of that German nihilism from Leo Strauss, which is, you know, bring us back to the nation we had or burn it all down. I don't care what's going to happen. There was no room in the larger narrative for how someone like Trump or someone like or something like Brexit could occur because they had completely left out this cultural analysis. Well, once you take the cultural analysis, though, then you have to get into like Zizek on ideologies and Jay Jones, right? I can never say these words. Um, you have to get in to how people behave, what people want, how people like, you know, Dimitri brought this up in a net. When you look at the old Hitler, um, the, uh, the, or the, I'm sorry, Mussolini in fascism, the people are like, yes, we don't, we don't want free, we want to be controlled. You know, you see this kind of sexuality going on that was completely missing from the analysis and has been missing from the analysis on the broader scale. Like, and, and so then stuff like Brexit or Trump. And I think there are other things that are lurking that are, that are not there. And so belonging again is, is talking about a lot of that and how we need to be careful not to just think of human beings as economic agents only looking after their economic interests um and because if you do that you get a bad map right it's you know you get a bad analysis um and it also makes me think i've also this week you know i've been uh really trying to do more on understanding john verveke's work you know with the meaning crisis i actually have come to like i must say i much prefer I haven't watched all the Meaning Crisis series, so let me get that straight. I'm not some sort of expert in Mr. Verbeek, and we've talked before about some of the problems with emphasis on meaning and so on and so forth, even if there's validity to it. But I really did prefer, he gave a keynote lecture at the Utah conference where he was explaining kind of his thinking of Neoplatonism, which that's really fascinating to me. I, I'm really interested by this resurgence of Neoplatonism and trying to think through all of that. I think there's a lot there um, that's very, very curious. Um, but a lot of, but anyway, like, I guess like with the meaning crisis, um, 
one of the things where if you say, oh, you go, a lot of the problem is people feel like they live in a cold universe where there's nothing going on and that leads to nihilism. Well, we always have to remember, even that if that may describe a lot of the college educated people, Chitan, good to see you, sir. The average person in America still believes in God, right? So that entire nihilistic universe doesn't apply to them, right? So that would not probably describe the majority of people in, say, West Virginia who are going through the opioid um, addiction, who have been going through these um, crises of despair. What is ever causing the mental health crisis for them is probably not the same as what is um, making it happen for, say, Harvard students uh, who have high mental health. That's, you know, it's quite interesting. A lot of people in Ivy Leagues have a lot of mental health problems, right? Well, is that the same kind of mental health problem as West Virginia, as you have in parts of the Deep South where there's no employment, or are there differences in the causes of the situations of despair, right? And for me, that's where we talked about with, say, the need for a poly theory of thinking about all of these different things. And so likewise as well, sometimes people vote in behalf of economic interests, right? But other times they vote in terms of cultural interests, right? And that's why like the Trump stuff or the Brexit stuff was such a, such a big surprise. So a lot of belonging again is revisiting that or bringing it out in an all, con in all um, honesty. You know, you write it, then it sits on your desk. A few months go back and you should get back to that, but you write something new. Then you look over, it's like, oh, I should get back to that. Then you do something new and then it's 2023. And you're like, gosh darn it. Uh, you know, we need to get those different things out. So that's what we've been thinking about and any of that, like uh, anyone who's more than free to speak, but I, I have been interested as well, just as a note, um, I've also been trying to learn a lot of Wolfgang Smith's work on vertical causation. Uh, he had a conversation with Viveki at the Meaning Code that seemed very interesting, and there's a lot there. Um, but then there's another move, and this, was, this almost gets into what we do when we read books as well. Like when Viveki was talking to Brendan, and he was like, oh yes, I'm a Platonist. But I don't, but he's like, but in my Neoplatonism, you drop the two world stuff. Matter is not a bot, you know, body is not bad. Um, and there's no idealism. It's like Zen plus Neoplatonism. I'm really interested in this because then is it still Neoplatonism? You know, there's this kind of weird thing where what do we do when we like claim a movement of thought if we're not going to bring the whole movement of thought, right? But then of course, who knows the whole movement of thought to bring it along uh, in different things? Because I really have been interested in all these people talking about Neoplatonism because I remember meeting Plata reading Plotinus, a lot of the Neoplatonists and not saying I was like, oh, this is bad, but I never remembered ever having like, oh, this is amazing. This is what I want to do. And so I've been very interested by this revival of Neoplatonic thought and trying to go in and figure out what the revival is. And maybe, hey, maybe people will say that's what you do with Christianity, right? Once you bring in Peter Rollins, when you, once you bring in an emphasis on escaping the true world and really emphasizing incarnation, is that a neo-reading, as I like to call it, a new reading of Christianity that makes it more palatable to the modern sensibility? Is there a neo-reading that's going on in Neoplatonism and all of these different things? So a bunch of different thoughts. So those, those are what I've been up to, Mr. Javier Rivera. Nice. <laughs> I guess I'll talk. <laughs> yes, please, Dimitri. It's good to see you, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm really interested uh, in, in Neoplatonism as well. And I just had a very simple conversation with uh, a friend who's not really like into philosophy to the extent that he reads he would read a lot. But, you know, in Neoplatonism, there's, there's this certain hierarchy, right? Like... At the top, we have the, the apathetic one, which Plotinus goes through some wild dialectical kind of dialectical hoops to explain still, even though it's apathetic, of course. Um, then there's the intellect or spirit or noose, you know, and then we get the, the lower realms. But I think, well, the way that dualism is is critiqued it's it's it, it's it's kind of it's it's always within the realm of self-relation that you critique something you know like if you're in a conversation like and if like let's say we, we disagree like yeah sure we can disagree but why if i want to convince you of my point it's about me you know it's not about the correctness of my point anymore there's something else happening there you know because i if I'm just apathetic or indifferent to that, then maybe 
that even speaks more to its truth. Um, now, anyhow, so um, in in life in general, it seems like you know most people I think are just maybe not content, but at least they have too much anxiety to really um, think for themselves, to put it simply, or like to really like go into the side of life that's uh, like that's that's kind of risking their identity so they keep to themselves and they they identify themselves with something and they keep to that because i'm that and i'm not something else right now <clears throat> dualism it, we should bring the question of jouissance to this question of dualism versus monism or materialism versus idealism and those kinds of things because like if you're struggling against dualism as this kind of term that you deem to be completely wrong and you struggle against it all the time saying how bad it is and how it's theoretically impotent whatever it means you're struggling with your own jouissance in a certain kind of way because there is this persistence of dualism within yourself albeit in a negative way so that's and and like what <laughs> like in dualism you know we can perceive the abs uh, the infinite to be in some kind of absolute distance to the finite whereas we would po posit that infinite as some kind of real existence and finitude as mere matter i don't believe that the neoplatonists are really like against the so-called lower realms or uh, or something like especially in yamblicus like he was super tantric in his uh, mode of being. He was like, "Yeah, you, you gotta go into um, basically the nature of the body to 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 become virtuous when you when you, yeah when you make use of it." And here the debate between the Gnostics and the Neoplatonists become very interesting because Plotinus actually keeps critiquing the Gnostics for um, positing the material realm to be evil. So this is, um, yeah, this is, I think, important to realize. So it's it's interesting, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's, yet, it's yet again, it's like, yeah, you, you want to have, you know, a cigarette without nicotine or like the beer without alcohol. It's like, yeah, Neoplatonism is great, Neoplatonism is great, but not like that kind of side of Neoplatonism. Like we get the decaffeinated one. <laughs> So it seems to be that uh, symptomatic uh, of our times as well. No, excellent comment, Dimitri and Jacob. Good to see you, my friend. And Mr. Ebert, it's good to see you. Mr. Ebert, I just finished your talk at Parallax. I enjoyed it very much. Um, the part also where if everything is ironic, it then leads to you're allowed and liberated to be, um, to be earnest again um, because the irony becomes invisible. That stood out because with the belonging again, there's this problem of sociological givens collapsing. And once they collapse... You can't bring them back without knowing that they weren't given. So they kind of, uh, they don't function anymore. Like uh, Wittgenstein re referred to bringing back a tradition like rebuilding a spider web with your bare hands. And I'm extremely interested, and I wrote a little note to add to the book because I wanted to want to explore it in part two of Belonging Again on that notion of recreating an inv invisibility that functions as a background for social action uh, relative to that, which I found really interesting. So the sociological possibilities of freak theory were interesting. And Dimitri, um, what you were saying there, it again, I'm just very fascinated about it, what exactly we're doing when we read books. Uh, because, you know, like I've, I've been reading Kanat's work on Kant. He's got that paper called Kant is not a Kantianist. And he wants to really strongly argue that this hard idea of there's a you're you don't access things in themselves. He's like, no, if you put all three critiques together, it's a much more complex picture. Then I have pay over here at attention doing Descartes later in life where he sounds like a freaking Neoplatonist uh, or where he's like, no, 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 it's not dualism. It's basically vertical causality following Wolfgang Smith. And you're like, what? What do you mean there's vertical causality in Descartes? I thought it was Cartesianist. And it's just so interesting because then it's like, what are we doing when we read books, right? And I think the online sphere, and I guess I keep asking that since I'm like a literature major and I'm always interested in like Harold Bloom and all of the different like reading people, like theories of hermeneutics, because it, it begs the question of, 
Is there some new way of approaching books that these online spaces are creating that we always have to have an open hand, it feels like? It's like, it's perfectly fine to say there's problems with Cartesianism, as long as you're always open to the realization that your understanding of Cartesianism might not be complete, or the same with neopragmatism, or the same with Hegel, or the same with uh, Kant or anything. It seems like there's this new way of holding ideas that is becoming very clear is needed especially on these online spaces that move a bit away from specialization and seem to have a lot more to do with broader frameworks, which I think are good, right? Because if there's a lack of broader frameworks, then it get, it's difficult to determine praxis uh, and things like that. I'm also extremely interested. I feel like Neoplatonism is more Hermetica than it is than the Gnostic tradition. But then I keep having people that claim that Neoplatonism is Gnosticism. Now I'm only beginning my studies of the Hermetica with, which is the cross-pollination of Egyptian and Greek thought. I will make no claims of expertise on it. And the reason is because it seems to me um, from some letters and writings that Hegel was interested in hermetic thought. Um, and I think that may have even come up. So I'm trying to understand it. But all of those schools seem to have some unique overlap that at the same time maintain very important distinctions. Uh, and so I'm curious about that. But again, it's just interesting with Vivekhi on Neoplatonism because he's using the forms of Plato, and I actually agree with this. I think it's true if you look at book seven of the Republic where forms are more like what the things that things unfold into as opposed to some ideal state. I think that is correct. Um, and where he's describing Neoplatonism that way is very interesting. But then I find it interesting because when he starts talking about the grammar of being and the grammar of knowing, that sure sounds a whole lot like nature and notion and Hegel's science, you know, bringing those kind of overlaps between nature and notion and how there has to be enough fundamental similarity between knowing and being so that we can um, have meaningful knowledge about different things. And so now it's like, oh, is everyone just saying similar things? But then I remember the theory underground people who warned that you shouldn't just see comparisons. You also have to see meaningful distinctions and so on and so forth. But let me pass it to Mr. Rivera and then Mr. Dimitri and Mr. Ebert. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, first of all, why, why is this, um, you know, a sudden interest, but I'm also interested in, in why is, you know, Hegel, Lacan an interest too? Why is the online sphere suddenly so interested? Um, and the same thing with Neoplatonism. Why, why, why is there this interest? And then, you know, because I'm re reading Lacan's seminar anxiety, right? Like, what what is the demand? <laughs> what is the demand that is sort of haunting us for this? Um, several thoughts that I have is that one, I, um, immediately when you were talking about culture, Daniel, it made me think about how I want to start exploring a macro analysis on anxiety and how that looks like at least attempt. <laughs> um, and then I think the other problem that we're having when we're discussing Neoplatonism is that we assume that it's finished. And I think that's the problem that we keep having, right? When we, it's like you talk to somebody about Neoplatonism, they're like, oh yeah, this is the logic, this is the flaw, and like, that's it, it's done, it's finished, ta da. But it's like, it's never finished, really. <laughs> it's never finished. So I think that's why we're like always kind of complex, like, oh, there's new stuff being said about new playlists now. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're going to tackle Neoplatonism. And it has to, yeah, I think you're right, Daniel. We're going to have to understand, like, what, what is really being said now? What is the new development of thought that is being pushed, um, even if it is retroactively now? Uh, maybe it's not dualism anymore, right? <laughs> it's like vertical causality or something. Um yeah, th those are just my thoughts. Excellent. And I'll pass it to Dimitri, Mr. Eva. Mr. Barnes, good to see you, sir. Your series with Mary Men is freaking awesome. I love that weekly conversation you have. And Jacob, I missed the, the question. I'm glad Michelle sent that forth. And I've been thinking a whole lot now about self-referential or meta-propaganda uh, after that talk you had with Raymond, where if the propaganda tells you it's propaganda while you're listening to it, does that make it more effective propaganda? That sort of meta move I've been really thinking a lot about. So thank you for that, Mr. Barnes. Uh, and thank you for your comments, Javier. Dimitri, please. Uh, Javier, I couldn't agree more with your point that like it's intrinsically incomplete. And I've, I've talked about this before that we are the completers. Like we are the filling in of that gap. So 
there's this um, uh, YouTube channel. It's called Esoterica. Probably a lot of you know it. Uh, he does amazing videos about Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, all of it. I really love uh, all of his content. Though he has a certain approach, which I think is valid to an extent, but also misses something, which is that he says, like, he, well, okay, let me say it like this. What his channel is really great for is that he has the best academic content that I've seen about esoteric, um, esoteric history and also very broad, um, which is quite objective in a sense. But in another sense, he, he would critique people who would basically take up thought traditions um, for the moment that we are living in now, because that, that would seem like uh, dishonest to him, you know? Like, let's say if I get very inspired by uh, medieval Christian mysticism <laughs> from uh, the Rhinelands, like for him, it doesn't make sense to identify that and see myself as being in uh, a kind of continuation of that uh, tradition because I'm, you know, how can I know that? You know, uh, I can only, for him, I could only go to the origin to explicate it better and better as I can, but I cannot take it up and say I'm like representative of, of that very um tradition well philosophy as such is very interesting because it seems to imply this kind of stance where you're taking up this as at least some kind of socratic um maybe not dialectical but there is some kind of um you know philosophy the genesis of philosophy is in in greece and with socrates and parmenides and pre-socratics um to him it's not that we don't the best way to understand uh shakespeare is really to try to get to the origins themselves, but it's exactly by reading Shakespeare that we can understand the Victorian times in England. So that is basically echoing what Hegel is saying, that philosophy is basically, which also answers kind of your question, Javier, is like philosophy is kind of an epoch in thought, condensed into its thought. <laughs> So, of course, it's there's something incomplete about it, but what I mean by us being the completers is that when we are reading a text, we cannot but to translate it to our own, right? And there's always something lost in translation, but in that very loss of translation, you're completing you're you're completing that thought and putting like the how do you say it like the the dot at the end of the sentence, you know? And there's some there's there's something of uh, there's a commitment you know you need to commit to to really do that and I think really the trick which also gets into like what you said Daniel about like have holding an open hand with these kinds of spaces the trick seems to be not to take subjects for some kind of for their you know one sided predicates <laughs> and basically like pin them down on that. But to yeah, really allow yourself to, to be in a dialectic and to see also the very fact that if it wasn't for that relationality, you wouldn't even be who you are. It makes me wonder if this vertical causation stuff and this intertwinedness that Babeki was emphasizing in his You Talk um, high note, it's almost like reading itself suggests that, right? Where we're the... Uh, there's a high, there's a vertical causation occurring with the text itself. Um, and by vertical causation, there's a thinker by Wolfgang Smith, um, and also Viveki has been talking about this, and I think really trying to emphasize it with the Neoplatonism, which is the notion that the form in Plato is not an ideal, like the ideal perfect state, but the trajectory by which a thing forms according to. And Verveke was also trying to emphasize that they feel like they actually have empirical like evidence of this now with Levin's work on the Xenobots, right? Like he's had that, like, you know, he's been doing a lot of talks where if you look at these Xenobots, the way that um, these, uh, these biological entities, and I am not an expert on the technical details, um, the way they unfold requires almost a telos, right? It requires like a form in which these things are operating mysteriously according to, to explain how they come to be themselves. Because you don't see any horizontal cause and effect to make them unfold that way. But the way that they develop, like basically screams that it has to have a telos.
right? Some sort of form that is making them unfold the way that they do. The way I try to explain it, it's like the orbit of a planet. And that's what Plato talks about at the end of book seven, is like a planet follows a certain orbit, but the orbit itself is invisible, right? You don't quite see it. Now, I know we could get into curvatures of space and time and so on and so forth, but there's like this way that things move and unfold according to, right? So vertical causation is the idea of how you're going to solve the measurement problem with Wolfgang Smith, which is the problem of you know, if we're measuring um, quarks or atoms or whatever, we have to assume a different ontology of the ruler itself to get accurate um, descriptions about those atoms, right? Oh, well, that's a problem because there's a disconnect, right? If the atoms are more real um, or the quarks are more real than the measurement rod because of a reductionist framework where the smallest things are the most real, how can you solve that problem? Because you need something that's not reduced in order to make sense of the things that are at their smallest building block, right? So Wolfgang Smith says, oh, well, you just say all levels of reality are equally real. You know, the reductionist level is just as real as the emergent level and every level is equally real, right? And that's how you solve it. Well, that would require positing a vertical causation where the measurement rod is of itself being acted upon by the atoms and, it's at, and the atoms are working on the measurement rod, all layers of reality in a kind of stack are working on each other equally and no one of them is more real than the other. But of course that gets into some kind of weird stuff because don't you have to say that relations then are, are real in of themselves? And I know we've described that a lot. That starts getting into Whitehead and Berkson and, and so on and so forth. So that's generally what's going on. And what I find very interesting, and then I'll give it to Mr. Ebert, is um, just the more I'm trying to dive and get a better grasp on the framework in which Mr. Dr. Verbeke is operating in, um, that notion of Neoplatonism, he's fitting with vertical causation. Uh, and I would be curious with Mr. Ebert if he feels like um, freak theory has a lot to do, has roles for vertical causation and things like that. Maybe, maybe not. I really liked your parallax conversation. I also really liked hearing the um, elaborated story of where the theory came from, going back to your days and the, the loudness wars and everything. So good to see you, Mr. Ebert. I hope you're well. Thank you. Are we talking about uh, reverse, like uh, reverse causation, downward causation? When we talk about vertical causation? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. Okay. Um, you know, I was actually just reading a, a, an email D Dimitri sent me, and and I've also been thinking a lot about this um, talk that I have coming up uh, on AI and artistry, and of course, AI is this black box. We've discussed that a lot here. We have really great discussions here, everybody. Like, really, you know, they're always relevant to my week of thinking. Um, and I find myself referencing these conversations. So uh, I'm grateful for them. But, um, uh, Dimitri, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to reference something that you mentioned as a launching point in the email. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, you said something like um, uh, the... The indeterminacy, the indeterminacy I'm, I'm communicating as if the indeterminacy is actually out there. I'm paraphrasing very poorly, but something along the lines that there is no thing in itself is your point, and that there is no indeterminacy out there as some external factor. Is no, that, no, 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 there is, there is. My point would be the opposite. Who knows, sorry? man? Maybe there's a thing in itself. I, I like there is, I, I think there is something right to saying that in a sense, Hegel does ontologize Kant in like an, in a thinking that's um, that's like a movement. You do believe that there is an indeterminacy even in and of itself that exists of its own volition out there? Well, no, I think I think I would say I don't know. I think that's my answer. I don't know if there is. Well, I don't think we but really the reason can know. You don't know, right? The reason yeah. you don't know is because you're Dimitri and you're a subject. And so I guess my my I'm not sure if I'm answering. So I might be misreading. So I'll 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 come back to this. But just whether or not I'm mischaracterizing what you were saying, the reason we don't know whether or not there's indeterminacy out there is because of our own subjective limitations. So in my view, there very well may not be. I'm, I've been trying to create like a um, a sort of schematics of limits uh, recently, and some good talks with. Daniel on this as well. Uh, there are explicit limits, which say, you know, we implement uh, when I tell my kid to go to bed or whatever the case is, and, and uh, or environmentalists, we create explicit limits before the implicit limit, which is the destruction of the earth vis-a-vis -vis the extractive behaviors of capitalism. So 
there's implicit limits, which are just sort of natural order limits, which are phase phase limits, let's say, which beyond which there's a phase shift. So if we extracted all of the resources on Earth and we reached that limitation, the phase shift would be death, right? Human death, anyway. And uh, But then we can create uh, preemptive limits within the circumference of the final limit that act as phase shifting limits, so behavioral shifting uh, limitations. So we get very anxious and we say, no, I'm not willing to put up with this. We all have to change our behavior now. And we see this all the time. So those would be perhaps working right now, explicit limits. Um, but in the context of the potential for an ontic limit, right? Like an ontic real limit. It's very possible there are no ontic limits, that the only limits we'll ever know and we'll ever be able to point to are subjective limits, the limitations of the subject. And those limitations do produce everything that we see as determinant. The indeterminacies are also contained within those determinacies um, because each thing we see is its own subject. We don't project indeterminacy into it. It has indeterminacy because it's measuring us. So because there's a mutual imminent identification happening with all things, and this goes back to like what Carlo Rovelli calls relational quantum mechanics, all things are measuring all things. So you're talking about measurement earlier, Daniel. So this thing is measuring me and I'm measuring it and somehow it's collapsing me and making me determinate to it and I'm collapsing it, make it determinate to me. Um, but within itself, per Lacan or per whatever, we can't know the, we don't see past that collapse, past the measurement. We don't see past the measurement. And so the indeterminacy really where it lives is here in the unconscious. My indeterminacy lives here. And my feeling and sense of indeterminacy throughout the universe also lives here within the limitations of my mind. Um, so the answer, like, I don't know if there's like ontic indeterminacy is of course the right answer, but it also implies that the reason you don't know is because you're the one speaking. And the reason I don't know is because I'm the one speaking and so on. Um, anyhow, Can I just respond uh, to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I agree with you, and this would get at the difference between Kant and Hegel, right? This is really the crux of the matter. So, um, for Kant, when we use the faculty of reason, we end up in antinomies, which points us to the fact that there is some kind of positive entity which eludes our grasp. You know, our a priori categories cannot conceptualize it. For Hegel, this is a pure thing of thought, that thing in itself. And therefore, this indeterminacy immediately attains some kind of determination. So the fundamental point that Hegel makes is that whatever epistemological uh, limitation you're pointing at is also an ontological determination of reality or of being itself. And this is basically what I think we can know, and I think like having a really uh, embodied deep understanding of that would be absolute knowing. Something like that, at least, to like <laughs> simplify it. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think I understand what you're saying. And, and um, you know, uh, the, the, how would I put that? The very fact that things exceed our capacity means that they, are always going to be collapsed. We're always going to sub-identify them or identify them. The simple act of identification being a collapse of their otherwise indeterminate potential. And they do the same to us and vice versa. And so we live with this indeterminacy of ourselves within ourselves. Um, the, I guess, I guess, I guess, you know, I would extend phenomenology. I, you didn't mention phenomenology, but it's obviously implicit and implied that phenomenology, there, there is, we just simply can't cordon off uh, phenomenology from any of the other, you know, studies. Um, they just all simply have to um, be invaded by phenomenology. Otherwise, we're living in fantasy land, a fantasy land where we're not living in fantasy land because the real truth is pure fantasy land. 
Um, and so in terms of like, what is the, the actual truth and whatnot, it's all constricted to the various um, constraints that we're living with. And those constraints develop, right? As we develop technology, we have new constraints and the limitations, uh, there's a succession of uh, differential limitations, but anyway. Um, yeah, oh, last thing I wanted to say, uh, you said something at the end of what you were talking about, Dimitri, when I first hopped on, and this is a this is a difficult point. It's 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 something that I always am very keen to be aware of within myself. So the idea of letting go of a, an identity is right this courageous act. It's like okay, I'm going to let go of a, a determinate identity, and I'm going to allow myself to be sort of the open equation and i'm going to sort of live in this state of like you know this courageous state but on the flip side that courageous state also becomes a defense mechanism against gambling your identity because the only times we really take a risk are not in the inertial state where we are simply being whatever we've been a moment ago and we're still continuing to be that thing even if that thing is no thing it's still now this determinant thing the state we're comfortable with the gamble is in actually changing and so in order to do that we actually do have to commit to a determinate identity and then immolate and you know die and die again and die again and die again so even those states like the buddhistic sort of states or whatever the case is the middle road the middle path non-attachment all those things are very courageous and powerful and risky only when you actually possess something if you don't possess anything you continue not to possess anything that's also a defense mechanism or it could be um anyhow so quickly what you just said to me suggests why the very act of reading you know i keep circling this problem of reading reading itself is a practice of that very problem because when you interpret a text, you have to hold it, take a stand for it, but then be willing to release it. And if you say something stupid about Neoplatonism, your status is at risk. People are going to think you're dumb. Like, you know, there's all this emphasis now on new practices, right? Like new ecology of practices. There's something about this kind of reading of text, trying to get at different things that in of itself is a practice of habituating one to what you just described. And that's why, to me, it's a unique kind of like there's an emphasis on meditation. There's an emphasis on all these all serious play. I have nothing against any of these different things. But there's something about reading itself, not just to absorb to pass a test, but reading in this very wrestling sort of, OK, I'm going to put my foot out there and tell you what I think Hegel said. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm going to put my foot out there and say, I think that the grammar of being, grammar of no, no, um, knowing is similar to the overlay between nature and notion according to whole gate. Oh, gosh. Like right there is a practice of the very, it's a practice that makes you more aligned with the reality you just described. Like, and the other thing, like that permeation of, the other thing I think about a lot is the very permeation of phenomenology suggests, I think there's this huge question right now. So a few, a few more things, and then I'll pass it to Javier and, and Dimitri. I'm, I'm increasingly interested how everyone has different languages across the quote unquote internet, right? They have different languages to describe different things. Like for me, once Verveke takes Neoplatonism, removes the two worldness, adds a little bit of Zen to it, you are talking about something that sounds like incarnational Christianity, which gets into NT, right? Or you're talking about something that's very freaking Hegelian according to the science of logic, right? And yet there are different languages and there's like questions of what's the difference between those languages? Where are they not the same? Where are they overlapping? There are all these different kinds of things that are occurring now in these different languages. It makes me think of the problem like if you go to, it's almost like what we've had for years is the problem like Germans know German, you know, Germany knows German, Chinese knows China, American English, generally, I know it's more complicated than that. And what you're seeing now is a development of like different languages that suggest different intellectual cultures that have to somehow translate to one another. But it feels like they don't have to translate because, if you know, generally everyone on our spheres are speaking English, right? So it seems like everyone speaks the same language, but actually it's almost like different languages below the words, like in regard to the signified, like there's, it's like a new kind of cultural problem of languages that is more obvious when dealing with the difference between Mandarin and English, but now it's almost the rising between different intellectual schools or different intellectual emphasis. And I find that very interesting. I think it's just something I think people need to note 
Because if you're aware that that's what's going on, it may help one avoid rivalries or unnecessary disagreements to have more productive disagreements, because that's really what we want, right? When you have disagreement, you want it to be productive disagreement, not merely linguistical disagreement, because there's a missing of the terms or, oh, my understanding of Neoplatonism is not that, so on and so forth. So it's this, like, in addition to reading being a certain practice that can help one kind of habituate themselves to what Mr. Ebert was describing, there's also another almost street knowledge, I'm, you know, like street, you know, street knowledge they talk about. It's almost like there's new kinds of street knowledge developing in these online um, uh, circles, which is the street knowledge that people are using like this language problem I just described. And knowing that and navigating that seems to be really important. Um, I also wanted to say I appreciate what you said about the net. I enjoy the conversations a lot as well. I get a lot out of them. So thank you very much. Um, I enjoy them a lot. And the last thing I'll say, I think there's a massive question of where one should start their thinking. So for example, for me, since phenomenology permeates everything, I tend to start with phenomenology, which I align with David Hume's Common Life, as Mr. Barnes has written a tremendous book on, on, on the iconoclast, and then position, like starting from there and going. Now, other thinkers, maybe like, um, I say maybe, because I'm not sure, um, maybe someone like Dr. Henriquez is more starting from the abstract sort of system, and then the individual can fit themselves into that system and overcome reductionism and nihilism, right? Seems to have similar goals of, say, avoiding nihilism, but different starting reference points, right? Are there better reference points than others? Does it matter? Or as long as you integrate them all together at the end or bring them in conversation, does it not matter? That's a kind of structural question I wonder about but, sometimes. Mr. Ebert. Can I answer this question, though? Once, once you introduce, I can't help but introduce it, once you introduce the notions of cognitive limitation, and then the, once you have limitation, you're dealing immediately with uh, excess. Yes. Right? And whether or not you think excess produces absence, that's on you. But if you have limitation, you're, you're grappling with excess. Once you introduce that idea as fundamental and inescapable, everything becomes phenomenology. Well, I, I agree everything. with you. So to show my cards, I feel like you do have to start with pheno phenomenology as fundamental. That's why I started but, the but you can't even You can't even ever leave it. So if you think no, you're you, leaving No, it, that's the issue. You never can. You always have to mediate back to the concept. Like, you can't. Like, it's it always... not primarily logical, accor like, according to Hegel and the science of logic. What do you guys think about that? Say that again, Demetrium, your audio is not a little bit. Isn't it primarily logical? Isn't that Hegel's point in the science of logic? But then logic is logic is bound up in the phenomenological, isn't it? Isn't nature and notion like yeah. an equal sign? Yes. Well, not an equal sign, a slash sign. No, this, yes, but that's how you overcome Kantianism, right? But this, okay, so this is what I'm interested with Verbeke. When he's saying the grammar of being and the gramming of knowing have to be fundamentally similar or you're stuck in solipsism or whatever that word is, that's basically something like Hegel. If now I'm not saying it's the same because I don't want to make that claim, but that there there is a according to his interpretation of Neoplatonism, you overcome Kantianism. Maybe not as Kant says it, because then I have to make that caveat with Conad and different things. The way you overcome the two world problem, if you want to use that language, is very similar to Hegel. Um, so that's interesting to me. Uh, but the phenomenological, no, I think you're exactly right. Like logic unfolds from the phenomenological. The phenomenological unfolds according to the logical. And so you can't be logical unless you're phenomenological. This, this is the weird thing. If you take here, I'll, I'll pass it on. But this is the crazy thing. If you take Hegel seriously, you're never talking about phenomenology. You're always talking about phenomenology slash logic slash ontology slash empiricism. It's like all the way. And it's basically impossible to always remember that or to coherently speak in a manner where you're doing that because of limitation, just like what Mr. Ebert says. But Mr. Ebert, no, I mean, what you're saying, um, that's why I start with like humans, like you can't start thought. I heard you making those on Parallax. You said it was really hard. And what you were saying about the recipe, my wife, Michelle and I, we talk all the time because we have this recipe of, um, it's that book of wild plants, like edible wild plants. And we're always like, how the heck did they figure this out? Like you were talking with the macaroons, with the cooking and different things. Exactly. You're always standing on the shoulders of failures. So are, so are failures failures if you need them to stand on them, right? It doesn't seem, you know, that's the question. So for me, you cannot begin philosophy unless you take seriously what Hume calls absolute, well, what Donald Livingston and Hume calls absolute skepticism, which is the utter ground, groundlessness, 
But then the question is the move from absolute skepticism to absolute knowing. That's why I'm always talking about the, the, the Hume to Hegel move. That to me is completely fascinating. And that gets into a lot of things. But you only do that if you make phenomenology um, fundamental. But let me pass it on. Whoever wants to speak. I know Javier, Dimitri, uh, maybe, maybe Haven will show up. Anyone? With the question of the thing itself, um, because nobody's, nobody's brought up time yet. Um, is there a framework of time that would allow you this speculate, like this thing? Um, and then on top of that, uh, I want to know if we can divide the idea of knowing, because um, I think Nishida, no, Nishitani, Nishida does this move actually um, where it becomes action. Action is a way of knowing rather than actually cognizing so yeah i'm just curious about those things i, I don't know if that is all entirely relevant well <laughs> can i just totally uh, relevant uh so dimitri oh yeah so hey here this problem has been bothering me for months um the distinction i've made to try to to think about it uh which is not satisfying at all is the difference between logical moments and temporal moments because Hegel uses the word moment all the time and he's like yeah moment this moment that but we shouldn't understand whenever he uses that word we shouldn't understand it temporally because he's talking about logical moments in the unfolding the concept uh, right so in the lectures on logic he makes a similar move that he makes in the science of logic and he says that um, thinking is above time and space so in other words to get at the category of time you already have to have made certain presuppositions which we get to the bare bones of in the science of logic right because in a sense um, I think Holgate uh, would call Hegel's uh, philosophy presuppositionless so the way I understand it is that <laughs> Um, it basically means that we presuppose as such and we cannot get out of that very presupposing and that is presuppositionless in itself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, to get at the, the concepts of time and space, we have already had to have uh, derived many other concepts which um, are like before that or a priori to, to that in a derivative manner. And this is that like above space and time, which is like non-temporal or invisible or eternal um, about Hegel or timeless about him. That's so timeless about the, the science of logic. I think that's what what also how Cadell talks about the science of logic being such a timeless text. And it's really interesting also to tie into to what you said, Daniel, about Neoplatonism and Platonism as about this... Uh, you compared it to the orbit, right? There's this kind of trajectory, but the trajectory is is um, not some kind of perfect transcendent heaven. It's an invisible reality. <laughs> it's like, and that would go in, like, get into the um, distinction between like what Hegel calls picture thought and actual thought. <laughs> actual thinking because picture thinking is like like daniel like you giving the example of a, a planets orbiting already gives off this image right uh however this what we're talking about is ultimately in, in invisible that's why philosophy is also such a strange activity <laughs> because you really you you cannot really see it <laughs> anyhow I'll, I'll pass it on <laughs> No, and I'll, I'll give it, you know, and I'll just quickly note, if that interpretation of the form is correct, then it would almost, it is very possible that that means Aristotle misread Plato to say what Plato says in regard to the forms and the substance and essence and accent, which would be great because all of the Western philosophy. Now, I also think you actually have to bring phenomenology into Aristotle's metaphysics, but let me pass it. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stick my neck out here. I'm just going through science of logic right now and highlighted every word, use of moment. I'm going to say straight up, moment is always temporal in science of logic. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, as an example, 
as a product is implicitly the unity of unit and amount, but, a, but unity of unit and amount, but as each term is only one of these two moments, unit and amount, or for instance, uh, uh, the moments of quanta, the quanta have for their negative moment, the reciprocal limiting, uh, blah, 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 blah. This negation accordingly is the negation of sex self externality of the exponent, which is displayed in the moments of the ratio. Again, the ratio is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, 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 true infinity. So every time, so just to, to riff on time for a second, when we talk about, this is my view and this is where, where my excess absence thing becomes distinctly metaphysical is in the isomorphisms I keep talking about. When you have anything that's truly collapsed, where the relationality is fully self, like a infinite self-relation, doesn't matter, you know, the best example, if you know anything about math, just it's, if, if you were ever going to go back and study anything about math, the most interesting to study is to go on osmos.com. It's like the mathematical.com and just type in sine one over X and it'll spit out a graph and you'll see as it approaches zero, it suddenly just starts going like this and it, Mathematics, they call it undefined. What it really is, is indeterminate. And what it really is, mathematically, absolutely, truly mathematically, is that that section where it becomes undefined is isomorphic to the entire real number line, which Hegel and many papers have come out saying that basically Hegel's whole notion of quantum or quantity is the real numbers. The way he describes it, everything about true infinity of quantity is the real numbers. And the fact is that that infinity, it doesn't matter what kind of thing you have, but any infinite self-relation compactment like that is isomorphic to the entire real number line, meaning you can draw a line from any point in that collapse to any number in the real numbers. It's the same amount of infinity is packed into that as in the rest. So the, way, the reason why I keep bringing that up is because when we think about a collapse of uh, space-time, <laughs> when we think about a collapse of space time in a black hole, right? We think about like the Planck scale, time slows down to almost to a full stop, right? On the reverse side, you go fast enough, you go like light photons don't experience any time, right? There's no time. And what do these two things have in common? Well, light is everywhere all at once. So it has total relation with all things at the same time. Total relation. So it's mm -hmm. fully saturating the uh the universe right but it's got full relation with everything you collapse everything again full relation time is totally related to relation so when we talk about uh the indeterminacy of the unconscious which is in excess of our limitations now just bear with me this is very like like speculative but if any if, if first of all limits are subjective number one and secondly that limitation produces an excess, which is beyond our cap capacity to understand it, and that excess is infinite self-relation, then within the unconscious, the unconscious is likewise isomorphic to any point in the universe. And the unconscious is likewise timeless. Because it has no relation, because it is infinitely saturated with relation, not ontically, but in relation to our limitations, right? Within the limitations of consciousness. So every time that I see Hegel mention moment, what I see is a reference to sublation and uh, indeterminacy. Any indeterminacy therefore is a moment because any indeterminacy is eternal. Well, don't think of it as linear, linearly eternal, but as timeless. It's a suspension of time, a collapse of time, wherein it is. And this is why I think me and Cadell relate, and I and I think maybe you, Daniel, but although I, don't, I haven't talked to you about it, is that the Platonic forms don't pre-exist. They're being created constantly. This is a Platonic form. If it saturates my limitation and recedes into my unconscious, it eternalizes and is thereby... For my from from my vantage, because I'm now because it's now timeless and eternal, once I've like through excess and it's graduated to my unconscious, it becomes a goddamn platonic form. I never even have to think about it again. It's always the same. It doesn't matter whether it's this one, this one, 
or this one. They're the same. In, as far as my unconscious goes, that is a platonic form. I don't differentiate between them. They are this ideal form. Once they graduate to the unconscious, they become sort of timeless. And this idea of like, do we know the thing in itself or do we not know the thing in itself? The one distinction maybe that we can make is between know to know and knowing. But, you know, where knowing is like absolute knowing. Do we know our unconscious? Like what relationship do we actually have with our unconscious? Well, we could easily say we have no relationship with it. But if we've ever meditated, if we've ever been in the zone, and in fact, as predictive mind theory says, 90% of our day is operated unconsciously. We're just interacting with stuff that we've already processed and put into the unconscious, and I'm just uh, interacting with tangerines, not thinking about it. I think that we have a much better understanding. It's an implicit sort of knowing. It's not an explicit sort of knowing. We can't put it into words because it's in excess of our capacity to schematize it. However, we fucking know it. Like, it's our life. You know what I mean? The thing in itself, which we are to someone else and <laughs> which we are, which this is to ourselves, is, uh, is so intimately known that it evades or that it, you know, to use Lacan's phrase, it, it resists symbolization. Um, anyway, cheers. Um, I'll pass it to Dimitri Javier. You, you asked the million dollar question of is the form part of the entity of itself or is it somehow transcendent of the entity? I think there are a few other questions here on, I think, I think Hegel's taking a stab at Kant where for Kant time and, you know, time and space are categories of the mind. And then of course there's the famous melting uh, candle example. It's like, Hey Kant, how is that candle melting if there's no one there perceiving it? Right? So then the crazy thing is the function of the word over when thinking is over space and time. Does that mean it is built upon space and time? Does that mean it is outside of space and time? And then when we talk about space and time, are we talking about our phenomenological understanding of space and time, which is limited? And then is there some sort of um, absolute time? I know Bard, Bard has those terms, temporal, absolute time. Uh, Bergson has different notions of time as well that I think is very relevant here. But there's time as limitation, and then there's time that the fullness of time is exactly a kind of timelessness, right? And then that seems to be what's very interesting here. Um, so those questions are there. The, this is where I think maybe the distinction, and then this is what I'm not sure, between Neoplatonism and Hegel, even though there seems to be stupid overlay. If, when I listen to Brubeke and Wolfgang Smith, they're talking about a vertical causation. And Wolfgang Smith also talks about seemingly different realms, the corporeal, the eternal, and there's another one that I forget, praetorial or something, I forget. So he basically speaks as if there are different realms according to which things, um, I want to say receive almost like a radio, but that sounds a little lame as a metaphor. So don't, don't quote me on that. Where things receive causation by which to formulate, because almost Plato's form in terms of being is a formulation. Things have a formulation is according to a vertical causation. But it's almost like in Hegel, the form is contained in the entity itself, right? where the thing itself in its being contains the formulating principle that comes into existence with its own existence, and then the form doesn't exist without the thing. Now, I can't help but hear Verbeke say, well, yeah, of course, there is no form without the thing, right? But then what is the nature of the different layers? This is what I'm not sure, and we'll have to read a lot more Wolfgang Smith, because maybe he'll say, no, they're different realms, but it's all, I think he's a Catholic, so these are all inter intercarnational related, so there may not be any disagreement at all, but certainly the coherent model has the form with the entity. The formulating principle of the entity arises with the entity and does not exist independent of the entity, right? That's why I like the, the example of the orbit of a planet, because even though it's picture thought, of course, there is no orbit unless there's a planet, right? You have to have the planet to get the orbit. And then the orbit is very real, and yet its existence, it's, it's participating in, per se, the reality of the planet to get that form. So this question of the form. There are also the other um, point, I think, and then I'll pass it on. I feel as if there's a difference between form of, I want to say the form of being in Plato and the form of thinking in Plato. The form of being seems to be this orbit of the formulation, the vertical causation, all of that. But then in Plato, though, is the idea that ideas present themselves with a certain perfection, right? They present themselves as being the non-contingent version of that thing. Maybe perfect's not the word, but the idea of a cup 
is not is bringing forth a cup that is not contented. You don't have an idea of a cup and say, oh, I can only apply this idea to some cups. When you get an idea of a cup, you go, I can apply this to all cups, right? Even if they have different color, even if there's different shape, the idea can be fitted to all phenomena, right? So the idea as a form is something that can be generally fitted if you move beyond the accidents of phenomenon to get at the thing themselves. This form does not seem to be the same as the formulation of the form when I'm describing orbit. There may be different forms in Plato, but here's the question. It seems to be that the Neoplatonist or this new take on Neoplatonism wants to say those two different kinds of form are fundamentally linked. That seems to be the claim. Holgate's language, as I understand it, is that notion and nature are fundamentally linked in Hegel. Now, I'm not saying they're equivalent because this is when we get into the details of the distinction. But this seems to be how everyone's trying to overcome Kantianism somehow, the, the, the popularly understood Kantianism. This is very... Um, interesting. And that's how I understand the different notions of form that are going on in Plato. Those are thoughts that came to mind. Let me pass it to Dimitri, Javier, et cetera, so forth, or Miss anyone. So first of all, uh, Kant is not just another skeptic. Like there, there has been many skeptics who have asserted the unbridgeable, unbridgeable gap between, um, how can we put it? Like, uh, yeah, like a thing in itself and uh, reality. That's not a new idea at all. What Kant was revolutionary about, and this really is <laughs> worth to really go deep into because it's such a crucial and a tricky distinction, is that there are, he basically derives the thing in itself from our transcendentally constituted reality. So for Kant, you can be so-called objective Although this would be um, a phenomenal objectivity. He doesn't reject this. This is also how we can even ground ethics and morality. Otherwise, <laughs> the whole project would have coll collapsed uh, in on itself, I believe, anyhow. Now, um, yeah, Ibert, I think your comments on time are, are very yeah, interesting. And um, especially the fact what you said about the unconscious. Now, I don't think the way you talked it, about it it seems more like the subconscious to me not necessarily the freudian conscious according to the slovenians though um freud did write that the uh the unconscious knows no no and the unconscious cannot um, realize death you know it cannot acknowledge that we die in other words the unconscious believes it is immortal which I think really aligns with what you said about the uh, certain kind of timelessness about the unconscious. And um, Daniel, about what you said about the idea, I think I think that's great. And I think that um, really the trick is to like after Kantianism, can we go back doing metaphysics without regressing in some kind of naive metaphysics? You know, and it's super um, tempting to do that. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, there will be only more of an increase in like religious fundamentalism and all these kinds of things. And um, like, yeah, pre-critical pre um, metaphysics. And this is where Hegel's word of, I, of the term idea is very interesting because for Hegel, an idea is not just a concept. An idea is the unity of that concept with reality or with being. It's the unity of objectivity and subjectivity. That's an idea. So an idea is concrete in that sense. Now, this idea is not... Yeah, it's ultimately an, an invisible idea. So, But if we understand idea like that, then we can understand the word ideal to be this and not ideal in the sense of it is like um, it is perfect or it is great. You're idealizing something, but to be ideal would be to have a unity in objectivity and subjectivity. <laughs> and um, yeah, it would be nice to see a rehabilitation of that, um, of, of that comprehension or that um, def defining of the word idea. Anyway, I digress. 
No, that's lovely. I passed to Javier and Mr. Barnes. Um, no, what you're saying on Khan, uh, yeah, the more I go back, like I read Conan, you know, Roger Scruton has a lot on Khan and different things like that. It, it, it could easily be, because once you take all three of the critiques of Khan and put them together, he certainly does sound like these neo friggin Platonists, or he, he doesn't actually seem to have a hard break between nature and notion. He just has the emphasis on notion, and that seems to be bridged when he gets to the critique of judgment. The critique of judgment seems to be critical, which again begs the question, what are we doing when we're reading? And then it's, and it, and it begs the question too, like, should we call it, you know, I, I put out that paper, like the problem of Kant, which is basically a giant examination of what are, you know, the problem of reading. Like in different things. So this is why I guess, I guess also this points out though, why I'm trying not to be someone who say, like with someone like Viveki, like my, my leanings are toward Scottish enlightenment, counter enlightenment, psychoanalysis, you know, these different economics, different things. I'm not big on giant systems building a lot of the things that a, a lot of the thinkers in the, what are called, you know, the meta-modern thinkers, a lot of the stuff they do. I'm not big on um, some of the personality spiral dynamics, even though I see value in it. You know, I've talked about cone dynamics. But then at the same time, so many times in history where I thought I had a good reading of someone, David Hume would be a great example. Hegel's a great example long ago. And it turned out I was a freaking idiot. And people were saying things that were a lot more different than what I thought has kind of made me go, all right, all right, everyone's talking about Neoplatonism again. I read a lot of Neoplatonism. Maybe I'm missing something. Before I just assume it's all a return to some sort of stupid thought, let me step in and try to see what's going on here. And then you're like, oh, interesting. There seems to be a lot here that actually aligns uh, with thinking that for me feels Hegelian, even if it's different. And I think that's almost, again, a kind of street smart. We're talking about this kind of street smart in these online spaces. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but there's some kind of skills one needs to learn to not make these mistakes again or to make needless dis disagreement. We want productive disagreement, right? We want a productive disagreement, but not simply disagreement that is a result of different definitions of the terms. Um, and, I, and then I think I'll just, and then I'll pass to Javi and Mr. Barnes. What you're saying about naive metaphysics is not returning to naive, naive metaphysics, I think is extremely important. I think all of these different groups are coming toward at different angles and different emphasis a kind of metaphysics that is not naive and that has this double action going on, uh, AB as I like to call it, um, freak theory. I think these things kind of capture it, the overlay of nature and notion. And I think to make it clear why it's important, you know, Mr. Barnes has been doing this. He did a wonderful review, like deep dive into all of these different socio-political movements that are going. He had that wonderful vision on like bioengineering, the Chinese organ harvesting and different things. And how incredibly difficult it is to say that it's wrong to do those things if you don't have, say, first principles or a metaphysics or a system that suggests that humans should not be used in a certain way for the ends of the rich, right? you start wondering like, what is the ethical foundation? And one of the reasons why I got interested in moving from Hume to Hegel is precisely because I could not find sort of an ethical background in simply deferring to common life to refer to why people should not engage in say oh, bioengineering, some of the stuff that Fukuyama's book is going into. So just as a reminder of some of the stakes in this, I do think there are stakes. And I think also, now, of course, we'd have to get into the details. I just made a given example. You know, in my presentation, I talked about Duganism and, and all of in Japan and so on and so forth at the Hegel Science of Logic. Um, but also, I think it goes in Mr. Ebert's where he was talking to Parallax. Oh, yeah, I think you're right, Mr. Ebert. If you take seriously freak theory, that can actually practically benefit your life. Because when you reach these different phase transitions, you don't like become pathological. You see it as part of the movement, right? So those things have those impacts. Um, but I think it is really important, and then I'll give it to Javier, to avoid um, naive metaphysics, while also at the same time understanding the importance of it, given... Well, it's like Cadell and I talked about the singularity. Like, what is your metaphysical framework by which you are going to deal with AI, with technological developments? Do you have a meta metaphysical framework when ChatGPT can do everything you can do better? Do you have a metaphysical framework that's going to help you accept that reality or not? Or are you going to try to burn everything down? Uh, and that goes back to previous net conversations. But let me pass it to Mr. Javier Rivera. Javier Rivera. Um, okay, so I'm going to say what I feel like is going to be a lot of crazy, stupid things. <laughs> Um, but I, the, okay, so this is not the crazy, stupid thing. I do agree with Ebert on, uh, <laughs> his, um, on uh, the way he phrased it, uh, that you can know the thing in itself, but it's a different type of way of knowing. 
it actually it actually kind of reminds me of Boober a little bit, where he talks about you can't necessarily know it, but you can be addressed by it, and in that sense, you know it. Um, and so, and, and that to that degree, I I absolutely agree. Um, Boober, yeah, I had to bring him. Um, and then also, Ebert, you you sounded this is not bad. You sounded a bit Kiva Guardian actually when you were talking about the unconscious, because Kierkegaard himself, he was, the reason why we can even think beyond or even like at all is because there's an element of eternity in our consciousness. Like there's an element there that is that. And it, and it's when eternity and time bring tension that that's when we have anxiety, basically. that That's my understanding of Kierkegaard, which I, I've always found fascinating. Um, there has to be something reflective about the thing in itself. And I know this would be also Hegelian too, but it's like, what I, what I don't understand. And <laughs> this is where the stupid part comes. It's like, one, why is it that we're allowed so many different conceptions? And I, and I know the immediate answer is limits, limitations, and, and the subject is involved. But the fact that this is allowed is just something that is always interesting to me about why we can have different conceptions and the very fact that someone could just have this bold maneuver where it's like, yeah, I know the thing in itself. <laughs> you know, of course we could say like the guy's stupid, you know, like how can you know? But the fact that this guy can decide and say, yeah, I know the thing in itself. Um, that, <laughs> because now it's like, I feel like we have to talk about choice, freedom. And the fact that the thing in itself, this question, is a question of anxiety, you know, like, what is the demand, <laughs> you know? And now I feel like actually exploring, reading this concept of the thing in itself in Lacan's seminar on anxiety, because it's like, is the thing so close to us that that is exactly why it gives us anxiety? Like, is, <laughs> is it, can we know? <laughs> can we not know? Like, is it that close? Um, and there's multiple theological uh, examples of this, you know, even the Quran, it talks about how the God is closer than your juggler vein. Um, and then even in, if I were to quote like Hadith from the Islamic world, uh, I am what the servant thinks of me. What that, that has always fascinated me, actually. I am what the servant thinks of me. And it. Do you say yeah, serpent or servant? Servant, servant, mm -hmm. servant. I am what the servant thinks of me. Um, that that's something that's also fascinated me. This reflective quality, this question of anxiety: <laughs> can we know it? Can we not know it? How can we know it in a different way of knowing than we typically cognize it? Um, yeah, those are just my thoughts. Barnes, Mr. Barnes, good to see you today, sir. Thank you very much. It's been uh, nice to listen to you guys. Um, just kind of want to add my two cents is it seems like, I mean, where I'm kind of missing a lot today is the fact that I've not read Hegel um, and that sort of stuff. But um, apart from that, it does sound like a lot of the conversation we're trying to have is ultimately metaphysical. And I think that the warning to not be naively dogmatic in that is is pretty apt. Um but I kind of just wanted to say why I think what we actually end up acting in terms of metaphysics is actually quite important. Like I, I'm, I put myself in the school of skepticism. So ultimately I don't think that, you know, at least as far as I can see anything short of a miracle, we're not really going to know what there is metaphysically. So I wouldn't say all this talk about determinism, et cetera, et cetera, is null and void, but it does feel kind of like, you know, us as, apes on this planet we're kind of grasping at straws trying to trying to reach out to something and we've all got our own way of trying to reach out you know like Javier's trying to get through theology and you know someone else is trying to get there through quantum physics um but just to kind of you know not be so negative to bring things back to somewhere where we can actually kind of get some sort of use out of this conversation is that the ultimate reason why I think that despite all of that metaphysics is still important is that for us as like human philosophical subjects, there is a downstream metaphysics. So for example, if you act as if there's, you know, metaphysically a Christian God, that has an effect on you existentially. It has a way effect on the way you act. If you believe that everything is 
um, just material and you know you're a materialist metaphysically speaking that also has a that like if you actually follow that through that conviction through it has a downstream metaphysical like the metaphysics has a downstream effect on how we are and we very often look up towards metaphysics to tell us the truth of reality um and i think yeah again like i said i'm i am a skeptic i'm an existentialist um, but that's kind of what I take from metaphysics. So I don't know if that's kind of, you know, lighting off any fireworks for you guys, but I think that, you know, all this metaphysical conversation we've had today kind of interested what you guys think the downstream effect of maybe some of the assertions you're making are, if, if, if that's something you can answer, I don't know. But... Well, I might take a stab at it for a minute uh, and then I'll pass it to meet you, Mr. Eber. No, the million dollar question. So if we follow the counter enlightenment from Vico to Harmon, the Scottish enlightenment, David Hume and all that, David Hume, as you know, Mr. Livingston ends with the absolute skepticism, which is the notion that you can never um, ground a phenomenological experience with an absolute idea of which is transcended from the suchness, if you use that Eastern term of the phenomenon, right? So you end with an, you know, so for David Hume, it's like, if you do not have your philosophy on our common life, you're going to end up, the term I've been using, you may like it. I may have told you, auto-cannibalism, you end up eating yourself. Uh, you know, cannibalism is where you eat a human, auto-cannibalism is where you eat themselves. So philosophy, in its tendency to naturally seek autonomous rationality, but has a natural tendency to become auto-cannibalistic. And that's when we get in trouble, right? You know, David Hume will talk about the philosophical ascent, the heroic ascent, where then the idea is over the common life. I think that was getting into earlier where we have idea over phenomenology, and then you get a certain self-devouring that can occur, right? So you have to return to common life and be honoring the common life um, in your phenomenology, aware that you cannot escape living out some sort of metaphysical system, but you always have to open it with an open hand. This is where like in your book, you say we can never answer the meta question. And yet we also can't say for sure that we don't have anything to do with the meta question because that would be answering the meta question somehow, right? So there's this weird thing where if you cannot say that, we, if you say we can't answer the meta question, you also couldn't say that your way of living necessarily has nothing to do with the meta question or therefore the, the metaphysics in, your, in the language you're putting forth. Therefore, you don't have to enter into like a hopeless nihilism, right? Because the moment you enter into a hopeless nihilism, as you talk about in Missing Axioms, you've actually asserted a value of which would counter that kind of ultimate nihilism, right? So what's very interesting is if we follow Hume, because for me, it becomes the start of the modern counter enlightenment, as I like to talk it, he starts philosophy exactly on that point of the fact that philosophy is in fact unable to ground itself and yet nevertheless thinks itself. And following the phenomenology, you see history developing in a certain way, unfolding as if there is a metaphysical formulation of which gives you reason to think that logic should not follow A is A because nature and notion are bound through temporal time and different things. Why I think that's important to follow through is because basically what has happened is philosophy has led us to Richard Rortery, Derrida, deconstructionism, and philosophy has basically died in academia or in people's minds. They're now turning to science. But the problem is science brings with it an implicit metaphysics that by not having philosophical training, people are not able to think through and to consider, right? Also, without the counter-enlightenment movement in my mind, you basically are either going to end up um, in the, uh, the, singular, the Western technological society that's emerging, you're either going to get tribal Duganism, you're going to get Japan, which I think is Delusian, or you have to go isolationism, um, kind of Amish or things like that. I'm not saying all four of those options are bad either. I'm not actually saying there's no good to those options. Like you've been talking about Dugan. Like if you read Dugan, he makes some very good points. Like that's the thing. Like it's ridiculous to say that mm. Dugan has nothing of value to say. The question is, is that Heideggerian answer to the technological consciousness the only way? Or is it Japan delusionism? Or is it to be tribal se separation? I would like to think not. So considering the modern counter enlightenment, Owen Barfield, Steiner, all of these different people I like to bring in the Kyoto school, I think is worth it precisely because if we cannot avoid having a metaphysic, the question is, is there a way to do it better? If the answer is no, um, well then ultimately the answer is going to be something more, well, to me, the best answer would be basically something very human, which is going to be more, um, well, we live on a farm, right? It's going to be more, you know, Bard will emphasize tribe. Bard will emphasize, you know, kind of you have the borderland movements and different things like that, right? 
Well, the issue with that is you're reversing globalization, and that may be something good, but it's also going to bring with it its own challenges. So these are all things we have to think that gets into the political and the libidinal economy and different things. But I agree, it, it basically avoiding naive metaphysics seems to be the name of the game. And I, I think this kind of movement that I'm describing, at least in my own uh, bias, caffeinated bias, uh, is an angle worth considering. But let me pass it to Dimitri and then Mr. Ebert. Yeah, I think that's very well put, um, Daniel. And the way I said it in the chat is we cannot help but answer the meta question. And that's basically what I I tried to put what you just said. Like, we always already have a metaphysics. So what do we do with that? Well, there's always risk to that. We obviously don't want to have a naive metaphysics like we now know like Aristotle has by just conceptualizing being in this objective manner. We also also don't want to fall into the autocannibalism of some naive skepticism. Um, so I think to me, like that's in a sense, philosophy is about like mediating that and trying to, to, to mediate that. And uh, Javier, your comments were all excellent. <laughs> maybe you said that you were thinking they are stupid because you had some anxiety about it but it also means that you're touching upon truth which is a good great thing in and of itself because you know anxiety is the only emotion that doesn't lie <laughs> so um um yeah and i'm dude i was thinking about this thing today actually about like there's this this term it's called like topping from the bottom and it's basically when in sex you don't have like a good top. So it's like as a bottom, you continuously have to get out of your bottom position to tell the top what he has to do. But it's like the least arousing and least horny thing ever. But I think like, I was thinking about this in relation to the master-slave dialectic. And it really relates very well to your quote. And I think at the end of the day, like, like the, the position of the master is frustrated with the autonomy of another self-consciousness to such an extent that he just tries over and over to, to you know to dominate it. However, this truth of the master is only being perceived by that servant, you know, which you basically said with that truth. And this very truth, like that very that being able to like by internalizing di that dynamic, kind of zoom out of it, actually allows you to self-sublate and surpass it. Which is why, you know, it's the slave that becomes eventually like a stoic and an unhappy consciousness in the phenomenology of spirit. If we situate that uh, right there. And I'll pass it to Mr. Ebert. And Mr. Barnes, I also know, as a general way to put it, um, and someone like Hegel, another way to put it, is they're trying to kind of argue that the very asking of the meta question changes how it is stated. So the question is never answered, but it changes in the very ways you approach it. And that permeates and infuses your life. So that's the weird move. The very inability to answer the meta question, though, is precisely the condition that results in the restating it or the remeasuring it or the reconsidering it, of which then changes the meta question back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, which is not an answering, but an ever formation. And not all, all formations are, then the question is, are they all equal? Are they all different? Is one better than the other? And then we get into judgments and it all gets fun because how do you judge that if it's all contained within that? Mr. Ebert, please. So this is, this is why I think the excess absence freak framework just is so fucking good. The very stance of the skeptic, everything uh, uh, that you just expressed, um, uh, Samuel, is that is is, is the perfect, no, not even the perfect, it's the required launching pad for a metaphysics um, informed by that phenomenology, the limitations which produce the phenomenological absence of metaphysical knowledge the, lim the limitations which produce the, the phenomenological limitation uh, absence of metaphysical knowledge, where we say we don't know, are, are the only place to begin metaphysics, as in why our, our condition such that that apprehension is absent. Now, what Daniel just said is great, 
but that wouldn't satisfy me. Oh, it's great to ask. And it, it, it has this effect on our lives. It's like, oh, whatever. It's wonderful to ask. Uh, then we'd be like a child and I'm like a child. Am I always in wonder? And that's very valuable. But there's actually more there. It's like the juiciest fucking clue we could possibly want is that we don't know. Now, why wouldn't we know? Metaphysical shit. Clearly, there's some limitations happening. Now, it just so happens that when limitations are exceeded, the information goes absent. And all of a sudden, we can start putting together this map of metaphysics based on the immense clue that we're fucking stupid. And, and, and from there, we can start building like, why are we, why, are, what are these limits? Like first, you, you identify that there's a limitation. And once you identify that there's a limitation, suddenly you have to introduce, okay, how, how do things go absent within a given limited system? If we take the first law of thermodynamics, just for the hell of it, and we say energy can't be created nor destroyed, and you consider this frame to be uh, the conscious frame, let's just say, and you have uh, uh, this earring sitting here. Now you want to get rid of it. You need it to be absent. How do you get up? How do you make it get? How do you get rid of this thing? If you can't create or destroy energy, how do you get rid of this? You can't create it. You can't destroy it. You can't get rid of it. So how do you get rid of it? You spread it across the entire fucking screen. You make it imminent, and it goes absent. And um, I, I will stand by that shit till that this will. This is my life's work. Like. There, there, there. This, this is the hint. This is the wormhole that gets us out uh, or through, uh, not by moving from uh, like cordoning off phenomenology. Being like, well, that's phenomenology. And let's actually talk about, uh, you know, whatever epistemology or ontology. It's like, dude, phenomenology did all those things. The very gaps that orient and divide the or the ontological space are phenomenological gaps, like the difference between water and fucking air. That's a phenomenological limitation that we can't see that they might be the same thing. Our limits are producing difference. And, um, and so then all the downstream effects of that, I think, are just, you know, beautiful because we get to uh, understand that, you know, it's a positivization of our limitations. I think it's very inherently spiritual and, and one of those turns that, that can transform a, a younger version of myself who was so intent on being limitless um and reorient our our that drive by the way drive is pure downward causation um in my view but uh uh but yeah anyway so that would be my little response oh and i wanted to uh thank you uh javier for mentioning this is a quote by kierkegaard uh, by the by the moment then is understood that abstraction from the eternal that if it is to be the present is a parody of it that's very hegelian that the moment is a parody. He says parody, but that's a reflection of, right? So the moment is a reflection of the eternal. Uh, the present is the eternal, or rather the eternal is the present, and the present is full. So he uses again like this, this language of saturation. So uh, thanks for pointing me at that. Cheers. Let me pass it to Chichan. Kierkegaard is another example. Just like Aristotle may have misread Plato to be like Plato in funny ways, Kierkegaard may have misrated Hegel and ended up incredibly Hegelian. There's this, like, Harold Bloom talks about that all the time, where, like, like the anxiety of influence, where, like, I hate that poet, and then the poet becomes just like that. I wonder if freak theory works here, too, because if you totally empty out yourself, you become isomorphic with total saturation of it, right? So you're like, I'm not going to be like Hegel. I'm not going to be like Hegel. I'm not going to. And you end up isomorphic with being totally like Hegel. The, the reason that I see everybody is like Hegel is because of this issue of excess. Not Hegel's, Hegel's pure excess absence. Right. If you, like, in my view, my reading of science and logic, and because it's that basic, Literally, you look anywhere and everybody is, everybody's Hegelian. You can't get away from excess absence. You, Hegel's talking, he puts limits at the very center. Uh, so you talk about, you know, Bataille, you talk about Foucault, you talk about anybody who's grappling with limits uh, and experience, uh, and suddenly they're Hegelian. And uh, Kierkegaard's talking about the moment and it's eternal and it's fucking Hegelian. I mean, it's pre-Hegelian too, but um, yeah, it's a powerful, powerful rubric.
Indeed, no, and I and the, when it's very funny because then when Kierkegaard uses the infinite absolute negation in a way that's counter to Hegel, it ends up being exactly what Hegel did. It's very interesting, and I like what you said also on the state of we don't know anything being the start. Well, that goes starts to hint at why the phenomenology at absolute knowing is the beginning of the science of logic, right? In that that structure. Let me pass it to Chitan. Chitan, good to see you, my friend. Yeah, hi, I was about to go to sleep, but I said I stay because the conversation is so good. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, it's, it's a fascinating conversation uh, in, the, in that sense. And if you start thinking about uh, this transition from Kant to essentially what we're thinking about is transition from Kant to Hegel in, in, in many ways. You know, um, uh, Dimitri's sort of point about antimony of reason and how Hegel sort of actualized those antimonies of reason to become its ontological, you know. Uh, grounding itself in, in in that sense. Um, I think one thing about Hegel that we normally miss, or at least we do not pay enough attention, is in the structure of phenomenology itself. Phenomenology of spirit is not simply a book which is, in which Hegel is, you know, uh, writing, uh, you know, uh, his thesis in, in, in its way, you know, like Kant would in that sense. Hegel is actually developing already existing ideas to the point that they reach their own contradiction. There's something very interesting happening there, you know, which is, which is fascinating that for Hegel, it's not a simple question of uh, that we can't know. For Hegel, it's a question because how we know what we know. And he's not dismissing the truth that exists in all of these movements. For him, all of those stress and curves, all of these movements through which contradiction develops itself has certain validity in itself. Which is which is amazing, which is beautiful in the in that sense. One of the things that we can really you know, um, the the other things thus the problem as I said with and with the discussion we've had many times, the problem thing in itself is not that there is no thing or there is a zero, there is lack in the void. The problem is there is always a minus one over there. In some there is a form of unity always which being sort of you know structures it with from within itself. And which Hegel is sort of trying to track or you know follow for so, so for Hegel it is not a simple negative thing that you know we can't know Hegel is, is very affirmative to that degree that that we can know and we are knowing at all points of time even when we are failing in 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 some senses and that is I think one kind of a journey that exists over there the other journey actually moves from Hegel to Delius and I think that's a, that's an interesting journey which we can think about. Uh, the other, the journey from Hegel to Deleuze is that what is Deleuze's criticism of Hegel in, in many ways? And at my reading, I may be wrong, and I'm, I'm trying to simplify it, you know, uh, in, in a way. Uh, uh, Deleuze's problem with Hegel is that Hegel also um, uh, puts dialectic in, in such a in such a manner at the heart of the being that di that dialectics you cannot escape either believing in dialectics or not believing in dialectics. It is it's almost a binary position. You know, and Hegel sees a problem there. For Hegel, uh, there is no way to say you don't believe in dialectics. In, in that, that is what you know. Uh, the Deleuze's problem with Hegel in that sense becomes. So, in, in in some senses, it becomes a very easy thing to say we are a Hegelians, because we all uh, we all can say the world is incomplete. We all can say there is you know there there is movement. There is it becomes a very easy um, sort of uh, reconciliation that 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 you can get with Hegel. Two very difficult questions. Hegel can sometimes give you very easy answers to very difficult questions in, in some sense. And that is where movement from Hegel begins. Any thinker who wants to start moving beyond Hegel has to start encountering that difficulty that, that they might be encountering a certain easy res resolution to some very, so I, I remember a Sufi thinker saying this, you know, we all know that um, each of us might, might be different shapes or we all know that Pythagoras theorem works. But do we experience it? What is our experience of that thing? In what ways do we allow the other to touch us? In what ways do we allow the other to, you know, and that is where questions of anxiety that Javier was using comes into picture in a very uh, beautiful way because uh, there is always a certain anxiety that blocks us, that, that, that limits us, and that also shapes our encounter with the other, both sides, uh, in, in that sense. And are we able to, and tell this question to probably, um, uh, Hegel would be that are we able to, you know, in some senses have an ethical position to that anxiety with Hegel or not? That that question becomes important, and I, I think it is in that contour we are trying to think through these uh, these questions. These, these questions. I'm not sure how others would, and I have, I have something else to add to it, but maybe I'll come back to it. No.
later. Yeah, thanks. No, that's excellent, and and I'll um I definitely think in Hegel dialectics is like to not believe in dialectics would be like not believing in gravity or something. Like it is part. It is. It is the principle of operation. But you see, that is missed if people think dialectics are merely epistemological versus ontoepistemological, or not, it's a state of things that then has implications in how you think, right? And yes, it does seem to be, you framed it very well, the movement Kant to Hegel, Hegel to Deleuze. And Deleuze is another example where as I go back on Kant and Descartes, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. I read so much freaking Deleuze, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I generally like the notion that Deleuze is describing the rhiz rhizomatic formulation of the animal kingdom, but once you get to the subject, it's different. But then he probably has a letter somewhere where he addresses that. I'm not sure. Um, I also like what you said on the negative one. If I were to speak very generally, it's almost like it's almost like if we go back to Plotinus, to Plotinus, not as Berbeke interprets it, then the form, if it indeed, if we take away the two world stuff then everything within itself has a plus one, okay? That is formula in itself, not over it transcended, but in itself, of which is its orbit of formulation in accordance with that plus one, and it develops toward divinity, and I guess in Plotinus, the one, right? So Lacan comes along, and he's like, um, if we were to kind of, kind of put those together, it's like, no, 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 it's a negative one at the heart of things. And that's actually why there's a movement, because if it was a zero, there wouldn't be any movement, per se. There wouldn't be any formulation, right? So there's a negative one, but guess what? God might be apathetic. So a negative one is actually to go toward God. A plus one is to go away from God because God is actually apathetic if you wanted to kind of put, consider the things together, right? Where negative one, to us, just, we hear that and your mind goes bad, negative one, bad one. Not It's better to have positive one. But really, if negative is a directionality, right? And this is what I think fit with freak theory. The negative one, sure, you have a negative one, but that's still a movement of what can fit into an absence that can get you to an equilibrium, and then you begin the process over and over again, right? So I think if we think of Lacan's negative one, not as pessimistic or bad, but a kind of almost, if I think in a Dante structure, you have to go through purgatory and hell to get to heaven, right? You cannot, like positive one, that doesn't get you to Beatrice. Like negative one in Dante is the only way to get to Beatrice, right? And it sucks. Like Beatrice has to like torture Dante basically, first through Virgil and then through Beatrice, right? And that is precisely how you head toward the ultimate beautific ergo apathetic vision at the end of the divine comedy, right? And so to think of negative one as that trajectory, as a movement, that is in the thing as a formulating principle is very curious to me. Um, and I'll pass it on. And the thing I'm also going to say, I think, Mr. Ebert, the, what you were pointing out on the difference between asking the meta question, reformulating the meta question versus what you were describing in the things itself, it's like the difference between nature, notion, form, and formulation. What's very interesting is the claim seems to be the very fact that the asking about the meta question puts a limit on the meta question that then changes the meta question because limits have that transformative impact is precisely the case because the forms of being themselves are isomorphic with um, the forms of thought. Notion and nature have an isomorphic relationship. This seems to be the giant claim. This seems to be what Viveki is getting at with his grammar of knowing and grammar of being Neoplatonism. This seems to be the overlay of, um, of, of Hegel. And so to bring it into the, the iconoclast language, the very fact that the asking of the meta question sets a limit on the meta question that changes the meta question is precisely thus because of the underlining state of things. That nature is thus. That's why notion is thus. And notion is thus because nature is thus. That's the and, answer to the meta question. Yes, the answer. That is the answer to the meta question is the isomorphic relationship. That's what they're going at. And that... And then it's almost like meta participation or something. It's like meta becoming meta something, meta freak theory. We can throw it's it's something there is how um it comes to mind. Um, but let me pass it to whoever wants to speak. Yeah, I I, I got some comments on here. So Lacan says il a de or something like that. I'm not I don't speak French actually. <laughs> um, it, it means something like there's something like a one. It's like it's an ambiguous say, say, statement. There's somewhat over one. There's something over one. So this is like analogous with what Zizek says in um, 
less than nothing, which seems to like oh, less than nothing. Min so minus one, right? Well, um, actually, an alternative title to that book, which he was gonna give it, was "I pure si muove," which means and and so it moves. So that means like although there is less than nothing, there is something over one that moves, and the very absence um, as a as a an excessive um, efficacy to it or efficiency, however you want to put that. Now, in terms of uh, Kant and Hegel and Chetan, to, to your points, and also to what Alex uh, said, yeah, like, uh, there's uh, there's probably some truth to saying everyone is Hegelian because it's not about believing in the dialectic, it's about the fact that um, even if you have an opposition of the dialectic versus the non-dialectic, it's in a dialectic. So, but and Hegel is is great with like extracting the truth from historical movements in their productive contradictions. Um, like you said, Chetan, like Hegel says, we can know. <laughs> it's not just affirming in the term in the terminacy, right? And um, like when I read Hegel, I get hysterical all the time, thinking, how can I can, how can he even make distinction when he's talking about the things like he is doing, like. Uh, yeah I, yeah, I guess he's like, it's always that kind of stuff. But in the preface and the foreword of the um, uh, Science of Logic, Hegel will act actually emphasize our relationship to instinct, which kind of is a precursor to psychoanalysis. Um, and Cadell will also emphasize this all the time, how the Science of Logic is about mediating logic with instinct. And this is where we get to the topic of the real. Also, where I can circle back to Alex and our uh, email exchange, because the fact that there is a non-relationship or the fact that there is a presence of the absence and this pre a presence itself is excessive, um, is contradictory, contradictory to the extent that this whole oscillation or however you want to put the dynamic between excess and absence is in a negative unity with each other. This would be the non the, the point of the non-relation, the kind, the kind of the trajectory of the ideal form as negativity. So um, in terms of, of the, the real for, for Zizek, like being broken from the spell of some kind of imaginary hypnosis, like imagine being in the spell of an ideology or a spell of, you know, being deeply in love and attracted to someone. Like, breaking from that spell is actually a break from the real. So, in other words, like, going into the anxiety of approaching the thing in itself, or das Ding, that's a movement toward the real. And we have all kinds of ways to deal with that, that we retroactively call culture, like I've recently been interested in food <laughs> and especially food culture. Um, and if you look at um, not only French blue cheese, but also things like bread and um, things like Tabasco sauce specifically, um, like those were all mistakes. Like Tabasco sauce, for example, the guy basically left a bottle of sauce with like vinegar and chili pepper or whatever they put in it, like for three years on the shelf. And then he tasted it. He was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> you put a name on it, then it can circulate. And now it's, uh, they tell, they sell sauce all over the world. So um, what what is this kind of retroactive movement and i'll just read a passage by uh, zizek here from sex and the felt absolute because i think it's applies so well he says the relationship between psychic turmoil and its expression in speech should thus be turned around speech does not simply express articulate psychic turmoil at a certain key point psychic turmoil itself is a reaction to the trauma of dwelling in the torture house of language what we call culture is at its most elementary an attempt to cope with this trauma. So that means the obverse of being broken from the spell in the imaginary towards the real is also an obfuscation uh, of, of the real. Like you cannot but obfuscate the real. And this is basically the problem of one-sidedness. 
and this is good shit. Can I bring excess yeah, abs sure, go ahead. into this? Because I, I this is because this is um so the way I see the reel is any excess point. It doesn't matter what it is. So let's just imagine any let's just imagine a full balloon. The relationship you said you described the first version, I think it was Zizek, uh uh the relationship, right? And it's a full it's got you in this days, you know, it's it, it's saturated, right? So that's the real. Anything that, again, the premise being anything that's fully saturated is the real, the unconscious, whatever it is that's in excess. So that relationship is in excess. You come away from it and you're leaving the real. Now, suddenly you're overwhelmed by a world without that person, the real again. So you left it, it's the, you left the real. And you're yeah, exactly. Like that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And that's, that's the, but again, it's because excess. Okay. I'm leaving the excess. I'm leaving the real. Uh, I'm overwhelmed the real. But as soon as I start to schematize, I'm like, actually, no, this is not so bad. This is over here. And this means that, and I'm getting through, then it dissipates from its realness and turns into the imaginer, uh, the imaginary symbolic. So as opposed to the idea that the real is this force that exists out there, the real is determined by my limitations, my capacity, and then my self-relating negativity. So from, from my view, when I'm in the relationship and it's saturated, the self-relating negativity would be a sudden like <clears throat> sudden break from the saturation. I pull away from the real and then I'm confronted again, you know? Um, so anyhow, yeah. But that but that's the but that's can I just exactly, respond to this? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's the curiosity of this whole thing, and that's why it's so difficult to talk about this sort of thing in in a complete way. Yeah, and this Alenka Zupancic really goes deeply into this in her book, What is Sex? Because for her, this that moment of you what you described of the self-related negativity is what is called trauma. And I really think she <laughs> her, her theory of trauma is uh, is the greatest because for her trauma is not a, a horrible experience or a horrifying experience or a horrendous experience it's the point at which experience itself breaks down it's that which you cannot experience and, and like alex i'll i'll just repeat to what i said in the email like I, I work at this place and there's this guy who comes by every single month and he's been doing this for the last year like as far I can, as I can look back into the system and he always asks the same thing and uh, when I, when we give this to him he always is like no 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 thank you and then next month he will come by again <laughs> now I'm not sure what's exactly going through his mind I'm not I didn't ask him about the neoplatonist one and the apathetic nature of it but like he has inexperienced something and this has been haunting him ever since and he's been trying to pin it down in some kind of in some in in, in the signifier basically in in what Anika Zupancic would call you know the missing signifier that which always like you, you chase it and it's just a missing signifier again <laughs> so he will come by next month <laughs> and that will be a uh, story no, marvelous. I'll pass it to Javi. Um, you know, there's a few things. Um, I really enjoyed Cadell's talk with uh, Professor Boltby, um, uh, Embracing the Void, where they talked about this interesting distinction between dusting and the real. And I have no idea if this is correct, uh, but what I've been thinking about it, again, I have no idea if this is correct. In the same way that I guess I started thinking about the state in Hegel as the natural, um, the natural expression of spirit, and spirit as the notional expression of state, it almost struck me, has come to, I guess a way I've found about it, and this may be entirely wrong, is that Das Ding is the natural real, and the real is the notional Das Ding. Where what I find very strange about that, that could be entirely incorrect, and you can laugh at me, because, you know, we're doing this thing where we're putting our neck out there, and we're doing what, you know, Eber was saying. But a reason I guess I think of that way, I find it interesting. Sorry, will you repeat? Will you repeat? Please. Please. How you think of it? One more time. Well, so, you know, we've been talking about nature notion, you know, this whole gate, Hegel and all that. So there's a way in which the dusting seems to me to be the natural real, the real, where the real is the notional dusting. Um, I don't know if that's correct. In the same way that state and spirit in Hegel are insanely similar and yet different in emphasis. 
right? There's like a different in emphasis. It's like when he talks about the state in the philosophy of right, it like he really wants to emphasize the natural, the state of nature, right? And yet the state seems really similar to spirit in the phenomenology, right? So what is the difference? It, why, like, okay, so if you're Lacan, why do you need to make this distinction between dusting and the real, right? Because we kept, a, a way I think about it, like, why does Hegel need to make a distinction between spirit and state, right? It's like this problem you were just saying about talking about the whole thing. It's so hard to talk about the whole thing. It's as if all of these people realize that to, you have to do different emphasis at different times to point to the other thing missing from the conversation that you need to go over there and emphasize a little more on the phenomenological and then come over here and emphasize a little more on the natural, then come over here and emphasize a little more on the notional. But since nature and notion are always isomorphic, you're always talking about the other thing, but not exactly the other thing because there's a different in experience and in emphasis. Like I am completely like, it, it almost seems to be like the reason for these distinctions between state and spirit, dusting and the real, I'm not sure. I'm just, you know, the if form and formulation, form and thought and form and being, if in the Plato sense, it's precisely the problem of the impossibility of speaking about these things. So you have to move between these different emphasis that when you emphasize one, it's pointing to the other because you have to point to the other and then go over there. But then when you go over there, you got to go back over here, back and forth. Now I'm thinking excess and, and absence, right? You're talking about nature. We need to talk about the state of nature. Oh, but the state of nature is isomorphic to the movement of the notion. So let's talk about the notion. Oh, wait, but the notion is always bound up in the phenomenological. So let's talk about the nature. Bam, 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 bam. And that seems to be... Um, part of the problem <laughs> like that that that's why we get all these different languages that's why there is the emergence of all these languages and then we have this translation problem we were describing at the beginning right so i guess i want to say the emphasis problem if you grant me that language the emphasis problem leads to the li linguistical distinction which then leads to a language problem which then to keep having these conversations be successful online, it's like the street smarts of awareness of all that. And like operating all of those different things and figuring out a notion of which becomes a necessary problem given the structure of what we are discovering having this wave structure. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is I love that definition of trauma. A way I think about it also is like everybody knows that something bad could happen to them that shatters their worldview, right? But there's a difference between the possible and the probable. And then when it happens to you, something that was possible now becomes something realized, ergo probable. It's more probable. It's not merely possible. And that's traumatic because the world suddenly becomes a place not merely of possibilities, but probabilities. And that has a completely, like, how do you account for all the probabilities in your structure of thought and not make it crazy? Well, you can't because you don't know anymore what's possible and what's probable. And that has this shattering effect on everything. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll give it to Javier and Mr. Ebert Chiton, is I, the thing also too, like you were talking about the phenomenology, Dimitri, where he goes into the content, he kind of follows it through to its own logic. And that's like where he's been, that's where he's trying to make the case that what he's pointing out is, is prepositionless per se. And it's based on that prepositionless list. Like he, he's like, look, I don't have to. I don't have to take my philosophy and read history through my philosophy. Go into history. Go into the development of self consciousness and see what it does to itself. But of course, there's a problem because he's the only one who does it. So he has to do it, which then makes it seem like it's in the service of his philosophy. But you know what's really funny? I bet you Hegel. Like I know uh, Zizek and all them hate Karl Popper. I bet you. I bet you like freaking like Hegel would be like, fine, falsify it, falsify the dialectic. Do it. And he would be like, you can't because it's not merely philosophy. Like it's not me. Like literally it's like gravity. He would, he would, if you could want to have the dialectic falsified and arguably you kind of could do it just by examining to see if anything stays as a, is A is A, right? If there's a stable state, he's like, oh, you can't, you can't find it. Oh, interesting. So you can't falsify it then. Right. That's what's kind of, so for me, it's kind of a provocative question of if Hegel's dialectic is falsifiable. Right? Like, is it falsifiable or not? And then the last thing I'll say is I wonder, Mr. Ebert, as well, in the same way that um, um, Hegel goes into all of these different episodes to explore the unfolding as evidence of the science of logic and the phenomenology, I wonder if you could go through like the stock market, the formulations of the society and see if you see a wave structure. You definitely see a wave structure in the, uh, the financial markets, right? You definitely see wave structures in quantum mechanics. You see wave structures in history. And if you saw all of those, all of those would almost be almost kind of like the phenomenology to suggest the legitimacy of freak theory, right? As not being, because you see these things by like when economics follows its own economic logic, 
it has a kind of wave structure that arguably follows an excess and an absence. Because when there's an excess of water bottles in Florida, they then send them elsewhere because the price comes down because you can't make as much off water. So they send it elsewhere. So the pricing mechanism also. I mean, and, it's, just, it, and it's funny to think that you could see it in different episodes. Look at look at skinny jeans. I mean, you could see it everywhere. Yeah. You know what it takes is a, a, an increase in frequency. I mean, all trends follow the dialectical pattern. Yep. It, someone starts it. Frequencies are, you know, sort of not so close together. You only see it once in a while. Not everyone's doing it. Then more people are doing it. Suddenly it's doing it. And then it, it collapses. It exhausts itself. It becomes an equilibrium and literally disappears. By the way, with regard to uh, negative one plus one equals zero, um, of, you know, the, the, the big downward causal mechanism uh, affecting us is uh, uh, our attraction to equilibriums. Of course, we came from an equilibrium, so this is related to the death drive vis-a-vis um, -vis the womb, right? An equilibrium, literal, actual, phenomenological equilibrium. And then we find ourselves just constantly attracted to these equilibriums. H however, they're also zero. So the whole magnetic zero thing is, of course, downward causal, where we're drawn magnetically toward the next equilibrium. But as soon as we arrive there, we realize it's non-dynamical. Right. And because it's non-dynamical, suddenly we realize we, we feel like we don't have anything. And of course, negative one is imaginary, as I think... Um, uh, you were some one of y'all pointed out, um, and uh, but it's not on the imaginary line. But interestingly, just for later, who did who made? I'll, I'll actually look this up. But there's a great formulation. It is uh, negative one, negative i one, or negative imaginary one uh, to the fourth power uh, creates a a interminable loop from one to 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 positive uh, imaginary one, negative one. Uh, negative imaginary one and on and on and on all around zero circling around we end up seeing it as a waveform but what it really is is a circle a circle being produced over and over again then we extrapolate and we pull it out across the number line but anyway uh yeah just wanted to make that note that the negative one plus one equals zero as you may remember during our lack series was like my that was my first big thing where i was like oh my god negative one plus one equals zero and um and of course nothing you know we translate it as nothing as an absence and so we do it, in other words zero entails negative one zero and negative one like as soon as you experience zero the equilibrium like it entails the lack and that's why it moves and that's why nothing moves and so it moves well, and I'll just add quickly, um, away, so, you know, we had the giant section on the syllogism and all of that in the science of logic, which is a lot of fun. What's very interesting is when I look on a sheet of paper, negative one plus one equals zero, I'm like, oh, nothing happened. But if I imagine myself going to the level of the formula and being the negative one, hitting plus one and becoming zero, a whole lot happens. And it's funny because it's like the different, like what you're describing is the difference between just looking at a formula on a board and imagining going into it and unfolding according to that formula. And I can't help but read like Hegel's syllogism thought as, no, 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 no. Don't think about the syllogism as something you see on a piece of paper and you know the conclusion at the same time you know the formula. That's the problem. When I see negative one plus one equals zero, I know the conclusion. So it's like whole, it's like, oh, nothing happened. But if, but literally if you went, this is weird. If you went into the formula and unfolded with the formula, nothing would happen. Like it would literally happen. And when I think about the formula as something you go through, which is what I feel Hegel is emphasizing, it's an entirely different experience of formulations and syllogisms than just looking at them on a sheet of paper. So another way to put it, I guess I read those sections of Hegel and was thinking about the difference between reading syllogisms off a piece of paper and going into the syllogism and being part of it. And how there's no doubt that nothing happened and the emphasis is on the happens there. But when you look at it as a piece of paper, it's like, oh, nothing happened. It just, it's just zero. Entirely different experience. And that's where making the phenomenological central is, is so big. Last thing, and then I'll pass it. A reason I really like, like the example of the skinny jeans, the stock, you know, I mentioned the stock market different things, because in Hume, we, philosophy has to honor habit, custom, sympathy, common life, right? You experience it. And then from that, you derive your philosophy, not the other way around. Well, freak theory by following that structure is derived from experience. It's not bottom, it's not top down, it's bottom up. And so that fits into a, um, a Humean counter-enlightenment concern. 
Like that would address the concerns of someone like a Vico, right? Vico would be like, oh, you're just pressing. It's like, no, 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 just look. Look at how popularity operates. Look how people operate. Then you see it's bottom up, not top down. And that's also why Hegel wants to start from we don't know anything at absolute knowing, precisely because he doesn't want to make mistakes like we see in a Vico, like Vico or Harman or different people are warning about. Um, uh, definitely, of course, I think he falls in line with that thought. Anyway, let me pass it on, please. So when Alex is talking about zero, I can't help but read the line from Lacan on the seminar of anxiety, which says zero is not um, Hegel's truth. Zero is the truth of anxiety. <laughs> um, so it's like almost translating what Eber is saying is like the equilibrium is anxiety. Right. And then you can't stay, obviously, in that equilibrium. Like equilibrium. You can't stay there. Um, but it's funny because like an equilibrium is exactly the way Lacan describes anxiety, the lack that does not lack, <laughs> you know, the lack that does not lack. So I, I generally where, like that phrasing. Where, where's um, that from? That's from the anxiety book. Yeah. Yeah. What, what page? Cause I have the exact same book right here, actually. Uh, it's a uh, 25. Amazing. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, 25 where he says the zero is the truth of anxiety. I have it marked. <laughs> Believe that? Wow. That's cool. That's where my bookmark is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the next question is actually a question is, is actually for you, Alex. Because um, I, because I, I guess I consider myself currently like a philosopher of passion. So I'm, I'm really interested in because like the way Daniel's describing the, the way we have to oscillate between emphasis, like to me, that is like the way I describe passion, where it's like someone asks you, like, why do you love philosophy? And the moment that you say it, you have to be like, well, I mean, I like this aspect, but like you can't forget this aspect, too. Um, or like the same thing when I go to like uh, the store and I really want something to eat, um, I go yeah, I want that, but I'm like, mm, maybe I want this too. <laughs> you know, what do I really want? Um, and it's like, it forces you to pick an emphasis of what you want to have. But anyways, the way I typically associate passion, and I'd be curious the way you put this in with absence and excess, is that I, I interpret passion as a man that is not not aiming for possession, but is possessed. So how would you describe that? And yeah, a man that is know, possessed. You know, like putting it in a, in a, in a highly interpretable and, and probably initially a, a, a negative framework, but I don't think that it is. I think passion... Passion is related to desire, but it's a desire. It's, it's more drive. And I think that what it, what it, what it, what it senses for me is equilibriums is, is its own death. So it's very much to me, passion is oriented with the death drive. Now, again, as we said uh, earlier, that real, which you attain or that, that death, that equilibrium, which you attain is not good or bad right? It's one, it's the relationship, it's falling in love, it's the overwhelm, but then at a certain point, like maybe it's what you break yourself away from and you face another uh, excess. But in those moments in between, when you aren't in a state of equilibrium, but you have a hunch that there's some new equilibrium out there for you that's just right for you, you know what I mean? Because again, the excessing of these limits are phase shifting, like limit uh, phase shifting only occurs when we ex exceed limitations. You know, this one paradigm exceeds itself and you have the next paradigm. And so you sense that like this next thing is the next thing for me. It's my next, it's going to be, it's going to represent my next phase shift. It's like, I'm on to something. And of course I don't consciously think, and the thing that I'm on to, I'm going to kill via repetition. And it's going to be boring. That's not, 
what gets me out of bed, right? I don't think about how it's going to end up being non-dynamical. But what I do think about in the terms of an equilibrium in a positive sense, and I think even in the Lacan, uh, Lacanian sense, in a way, is that as soon as it becomes equal, uh, an equilibrium, as soon as, especially in philo philosophy, like I'm working on this excess absence, I'm working, working, working on it. And I know now because I'm working on excess absence that at some point I'm going to exceed, I'm going to saturate myself with excess absence and it's going to become second nature where I'm no longer thinking about it all the time, but it is the operating underlying equilibrium of my continuation, right? And so it becomes just rote. And at that point, it won't be as fun for me. And I probably won't get all excited talking about it. I'll be, you know what I mean? And, uh, and hopefully, though, I'll have some next thing. But, uh, but I do think that it's related to uh, 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 the desire for the next equilibrium. So it's not necessarily about avoiding equilibriums, or whatever, like the real absolute knowing for me, or the real dance of life to me, is the full immersion and going for the saturation and then be willing being willing to leave it uh if 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 that's what you know or or not necessarily leave it right because allowing it to die but by dying becoming one of the most foundational aspects of you because it's graduated into equilibrium and it's no longer dynamical and mm -hmm. um that said there's uh but anyway yeah that's how that's that's how i experience passion anyway it is mindless it is it is possessed i'm possessed but it's in that sense very much like drive where I'm acquiring exteriority, I'm searching, I'm 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 out there, and it's uh, it's uh, fully compulsive. Yeah, fully compulsive. Yeah. And if yeah. I could just respond real quick, um, when you're talking about the equilibrium, it actually reminded me. I have to find the page again, but like where the con talks about the one thing the neurotic doesn't want to give is their anxiety. That's the one thing, right? And that, ironically, that is actually. Like exactly what you're talking about, that giving is what will get us to the next equilibrium. But we have to eventually give it again and again and again. So I again, yeah, I really like that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll pass it on. Yeah, the moment you give up your anxiety, you're vulnerable, right? Makes me think of that. Uh, you know, the paranoid, the the par the guy who's paranoid is he's ready. Uh, there was this like long ago. There was that Batman animated show that came on Cartoon Network at like five in the afternoon. It was the first animation where they did it on black sheets of paper. That's why it had the dark thing. It was really cool. There's this one episode with this guy obsessed with time and his clock, and everyone was like, "Man, you got to be less time obsessed, time obsessed." And one day he's like, "Fine, I'm not going to follow the clock." And he goes to the park, and he's he, like, something happens, and he's late. The one day he didn't bring his clock because he was going to be free of the clock. He loses his job. He loses everything. So then he becomes a super villain called like the Watchman or something like that. So yeah, don't want to lose that anxiety. You, mess, you may be the next Batman villain or something. But let me, Mr. Barnes, good to see you, sir. Chitan, please. Yeah, uh, fascinating stuff, actually. So uh, I think one of the uh, starting point would be that, you know, I, I got a quote from Ripantik's book, actually, which I thought would be interesting to get back to close that discussion we were having. She says, what psychoanalysis teaches us is not that because of this non-relation, we have access to only partial and fleeting pleasure and satisfaction. Squeeze here and there. The claim is stronger. These partial pleasures and satisfactions are already informed by the negatively implied by non-relation. So in some senses, in some senses, the very fact of the partial nature of the tribes itself in, in, sort of informs it, itself by a certain kind of unity built into them. It's not that you are you have access to partial, then you have access to unity in some other form. The very partial um, structuring of the drives are informed by certain you know negativity. I think once we sort of start thinking about this problem of negativity, uh, in Lacan there's something very interesting which happens, which I think which 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 hasn't been explored philosophically fully yet, uh, which is that in in Lacan this negativity in, sort of emerges in three forms of subjects. The, the neurotic, psychotic, and the you know perverse in that sense that there are three forms of negation implied in it: the repression, foreclosure, um, and disavowal. In in that sense, um, if you think about it, uh, Lacan is not simply saying that you can have this 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 uh, what, what is the word for it? Uh, this impartial relationship to this negativity. This negativity is always already in sort of emerging with a certain relationship to this negativity in that sense. You know, so either you can repress it, either you can 
um, you know, completely foreclose it, or you can you know recognize it and yet deny it, and you know that game that power plays. And when you and then it is here this question of juice and sort of comes into picture. And I am just coming back to Harvey's Harvey's question of uh, you know. Um, Passion in that sense. If you think about Lacan's Jusans, Jusans is a very interesting concept. Jusans, as, as, as an idea, is, is actually existing at the split of the subject itself. That at a point, human instincts can be such where you can, you, they can be life affirming. They can be working through a certain adaptation of the organism to his environment such that he's, 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 you know, he's sort of fighting for his own survival and so on and so forth. But there's a form of enjoyment possible, which is not life of a mingit which in their drives can directly get hooked onto the dead drives. You know, so for example, I can, I, I can think I want to commit suicide, I want to die, I, I, nothing is working for me, and yet I can be getting some pleasure from it. You know, some enjoyment from it. That is the problem of Jewish science. So Jewish science is not simply, uh, uh, you know, the, this this simple simplistic thing where human, where, which which is affirming life in itself. Although it, it it is in its own way, we can have a discussion on that. But Jewish science fundamentally that split, which which doesn't allow subject to be completely attached to its own self, which breaks the gap in that identity itself, you know, and and passion that way is something extremely interesting. Because passion is is, is uh, it, it cannot be completely it cannot be completely reduced to in, in, this hooking onto dead drives in, in some senses, and yet it cannot be completely sort of got on the other side also, where you you can you can simply identify it with a certain form of enjoyment which is uh, uh, you know only linked to survival of the or organism. That is why it gets linked to love. In one form or the love becomes a, a, a form of thing, way of thinking of the ethics of Jew science in some senses, because we all have our own kicks and pleasures that we get from things, which which may, which which may not be directly you know life affirming in 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 in, in, the, in the least way to put it is, is is that that our affective states beyond certain point of threshold always gets directly hooked to the dead drive, and this. Fundamentally, at least one of the ways I'm thinking about it is a fundamentally question of entropy. And uh, uh, Ebert is right about it. That there's a, there's a, there's a, what is at stake is a question of equilibrium. Entropy by means, I mean that that something will always reach its own max, you know, and there's, a, there's an equilibrium that an organism will stay with, reach with its environment. And then that is the death point of it. And yet life sort of keeps on uh, uh, sort of functioning because we can create the negative entropy. We can always delay that maximal state. We can always delay that equilibrium with the environment. And so, do science has something to do with that, you know? And uh, just sort of just putting it last, uh, uh, some last bit to my problem. Uh, when we're discussing this question of sort of Delis De De and uh, Hegel, and we were going to this question of thing in itself, Delis' problem with Hegel is enjoyment itself. That Hegel can't enjoy. Hegel is negative. You know, Nietzsche is the positive man. He's the yes. You know, Hegel can't, in some senses, enjoy. Hegel's enjoyment is always linked to this form of dead drive, which is, you know, perverse in nature in some senses. And and in this sense, Jusans always involves a certain form of perversion, certain form of a knowledge which is a knowledge which is not, uh, which is not activated in any form. So I know what I enjoy. But uh, so that is why when a perverse sits in a clinical clinical setting, perverse knows what he enjoys. You can't tell it to him. The the, the relationship to the bigger that changes in, in, in a clinical setting with a perverse because perverse already knows. You cannot tell it to him. Neurotic is anxious, he doesn't know, he literally listens. Perverse already knows. You know, then what do you do with it? So what do you do with the form of knowledge which is a knowledge which cannot be activated to anything? In which you already know. And you are sure of it, you are getting a kick out of it, you're getting you're getting your enjoyment out of it. And yet that is not doing anything. What is that form of knowledge? And at what point we are encountering those forms of knowledges in our in our thinking and philosophy? And that's one of the questions that I've been trying to think about myself. That at what point knowledge becomes perverse? At what point knowledge becomes a knowledge of something which you know, and you don't know anything wrong about it. But it's a form of knowledge in which you're only gaining such as perverse enjoyment from. And it, it is not capable of doing anything else. To activate it in something, some different form needs some th something, some other trajectory for it to be, you know, thought through. I'm not sure how you think about it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, like the the way Freud talks about perfect is that he says it's the inverse of the neurotic. 
And actually, every neurotic relies on some kind of perverted ritual to sustain its very obsessional neurosis, right? And um, in terms of, um, I think the point of equilibrium is what Lacan would call impossible jouissance. It's like the, the apex of jouissance, which is for that very same reason, uh, real inexperience, right? So Daniel, you asked the question earlier, what's how the difference between das Ding and the real? Well, the way I see it is that there's three registers, right? There's the symbolic, there's the imaginary, and there's the, the real. So when I immediately tell you this, it seems like three positive entities, but I, the real is the negative uni unity of the symbolic and the imaginary in which das Ding is. And this is at the point of the impossible jouissance of equilibrium. That's how I would understand it. So object A, what's object A then? Well, this is like the the the, the remainder, like a, I, I think of it of like a sliver of the real that has been mediated by desire as a very compromise or like defense against uh, against the real. <laughs> And against the impossible uh, jouissance, like the way that I think Chatan's uh, uh, example couldn't be better, like like enjoying to think about killing yourself, you know, <laughs> and the desire as already, you know, you're already uh, avoiding something. Also, um, uh, Baris Fidaner is a Turkish uh, Shizekian. He wrote this article about curiosity. And, you know, whenever we think of uh, words like life affirming or passion or curiosity, we all think of like how, how nice it is and um, how great. But actually for both Freud and Lacan, like curiosity is grounded in a fundamental incuriosity. You don't want to know something and that's why you occupy yourself with something else to avoid that thing which you don't want to know. And that's the obsessional neurosis. That's like, you know, being obsessed about, you know, having obsessional and compulsive ideation. No, lovely. And a, and a few comments. Um, it, it's very, like, I guess the way I always thought about, yeah, I can never say the French term, uh, yes, um, is that it's never just. Like, if someone wants to commit suicide, it's never just they want to commit suicide. There's something else going on. If, if, they, uh, if they want to be, you know, the CEO of a company, it's never just that they want to be the CEO of the company. There's always something else. There's always a discreet, there's some discreet fair. Um, there's something that is hidden that is not being brought out. And to me, it's interesting because I always link that up with Augustine, where he makes the point that there's no such thing as an evil motivation. If you do X, you think it's good. If you want to kill someone, you think it's good to kill that someone. Well, that's kind of weird then, because that means the line between evil and good, moral evil and good, they're, they're always blended, right? And so there's something there where you say, oh, I want to kill myself. Like, the very desire to want to kill yourself has some sort of reason why you think it's good to do that. And then Lacan is taking what, what Augustine is really kind of setting in the ethical, Lacan is bringing it into desire. So there's a, it's interesting to think of those together. Um, yeah, now I have to think the on that too, right? With the dusting and the real, all of that. I'm glad you brought this together. It's kind of like, I've been thinking a lot. It's a different subject. Like, you know, Verveke talks about transvectivity, which is the interplay where relations are real between subject and object. I like to talk about intersuppositions versus presuppositions, the suppositions that one can arrive at due to um, emergent or relational experiences that are real and are not reducible to the variables and what intersuppositions can you arrive at in that way. And then the conditionalism, the conditioning that makes possible those intersuppositional relations. And now I'm tempted to try to think overlaying those together. That's a different subject. I'm also extremely curious with Deleuze's critique of the negativity of Hegel, where Hegel is too negative. Like, again, I, I can't say I, um, it's kind of interesting because we're like, oh, there's too much negativity in Hegel. Well, you know, Deleuze was a big Kafka uh, expert and Kafka was like apparently the funniest, happiest person, right? He had these really negative stories about mice getting eaten in halls and he would like cry with laughter while he was doing his stories, right? So there's something also weird where if indeed Hegel has something apathetic going on, like something that has a negativity to it is actually not bad. You know, I always am taken by the biographies of Hegel where he would like, where he had dinner that time with the poet Goethe, uh, Go, I can have G-O-E-T-H-E. And apparently it was just the life of the party. People were like, man, this guy is great. Uh, he's hilarious. He never stops talking. He's really fun. And it's interesting to think how sometimes the stories or the writers who are actually like pessimistic 
there's some sort of secret in negativity that almost can unlock joy uh, or can unlock a, a, like, why is it that, you know, you have, you know, some, some Christians, for example, whose entire idea is dying on a cross, what the, is uh, really nice people taking care of the poor. Now, some of them are fundamentalist crazy people, of course, but it's always interesting how what we think is going to be negative or think is going to lead to um, problems actually can have a reverse effect. That is that is interesting. And um, and then, of course, if negativity is actually more directionality versus like negative one is almost kind of like a direction, then that would also suggest moving toward an equilibrium if we use a freak theory direction. But again, the debate between Deleuze and Hegel is always fascinating to me. Also, I was going to note if, in fact, there is always uh, it's not just like if you want to commit suicide, but there's also like it's not just the desire to commit suicide. That in of itself would be a case study of A.B. versus A.A., right? Like if there's always something that's left out of the thinking that that makes it move. Like this is the funny thing. I guess this is the structure. And yet it moves. Right. If that's some sort of deep ontological statement, then everything is always leaving something out. Like in its seeking, in its being, in its thinking, there's always a left out that makes the space of that movement that seems self-generated by the thing, right? And this is the, the strange structure that we're describing, where everything has the ability in of itself to yet move, to yet unfold, that is not separatable from the entity itself, right? There's always a leftover, rather it be in a desire, Rather it be in a being, rather it is in a thought, there's always something left out and thus it moves, which of course would be a freak theory structure, right? Which would have that, that structure going on. Again, and then I'll pass it to Mr. Ebert and Teton. Um, that would then fall in line with Ver what Verveke is saying about Neoplatonism and the vertical causation. I guess, again, it might just all be language problems. Vertical causation sounds transcendent from the sky on us, working on us. Whereas what Verveke seems to be describing with, you know, talking with um, Wolfgang Smith, is that that vertical causation is part of the entity itself. The, the formulation is in of itself. Um, and then the form of idea is isomorphic with the formulation of being, and then they are informing one another. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's curious in that way. Uh, but let me pass it on. Cool shit. Uh, just gonna read a couple of things. Um... Uh, well, let me pause it first. That the 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 thing, das Ting, is um, is the excess from the subject's point of view, and petite object a uh, is uh, the translation of that excess into absence. Could happen absolutely simultaneously. But anyway, um, here are uh, a couple quotes. Um, I like this one. For Lacan, the jugs, this is from Journal of Psychoanalysis uh, somewhere anyway. I'm about to quote Lacan himself. Uh, Lacan's, uh, the jugs shape embodies a primordial signifier which creates the void. So we're talking about how for Heidegger, fullness of water or wine pour to the brim as opposed to like where the void is. So it presents this fullness. Uh, for Lacan, the jug shape embodies a primordial signature which creates the void by introducing a positivity or made aware of the negativity, in other words. Uh, and so introduces the perspective prospect of fullness. Thus, the jug comes to represent, quote, the existence of the void at the center of that reality called the thing. Um, in another passage, the thing is, quote, at the center of the significant relations in which the unconscious organizes itself. At the center of the significant relations in which the unconscious organizes itself, those relations, which are in excess of our conscious capacity to comprehend, and therefore sort of in, you know, uh, in these unified, uh, sublated states. Um, and, uh, but only insofar, uh, so significant, at the center of the significant relations in which the unconscious organizes itself, but only insofar as it is excluded, foreign to the self, even though being at the very heart of it, the seat of the intimate exteriority or exteriors, exterioracy. Further, the thing is that is that part of the real, the real as a whole, the real of the subject and the real outside of it, which suffers from the signifier, or in other words, see, okay, the thing is that part of the real, which suffers from the signifier. We talked about this last week, or I did anyway, where language collapses the real, right? 
and packages it, but but thereby contains it and keeps this this uh, its essence obscured, and that's what brings this anxiety. We don't know what it thinks about us, and we we don't know where it's at, and we have this sort of dread of what's contained within this package. Um, further, the thing is that part of the real, the real as a whole, the real of the subject, real outside of it, which suffers from the signifier, or in other words, quote, the incidence of the signifier on the psychic real. Um, so anyway, uh, I just like all of that. Uh, I just like all of this stuff. I mean, this stuff, the extent to which this conversation, like, is more than just fun to talk about, you know, I'm not sure, but, but, but it is, uh, it, there is something, there is something here. And I don't think, for instance, that Lacanian real, I don't think that a lot of these concepts have had their day. Like, I think they're still in sort of backroom SNL writing, like skit mode. You know what I mean? They haven't like graduated to implementation uh, for real, for real, uh, at, at least philosophical implementation yet. But I think that they can, uh, if we start to understand why it is, for instance, uh, that uh, that the thing would be invisible that is present. And again, I think that comes back to sort of a, a, an, an excess absence issue. But um, anyway, I just wanted to read those quotes. Cheers. And this has been fun. And I also have to split. But yeah, it's been dope. It's been a delight, Mr. Ebert. Let me pass it to Chichan. It is interesting. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about the difference between Standing Reserve and Wine and Heidegger and his essay on The Thing. The Thing seems quite quite fascinating here. Uh, and then Lacan, you know, there's pictures of Lacan and Heidegger together. And I agree with what you said. Um, Chichan, please. Uh, just so quickly coming back to that point of, you know, Jusant, uh, I just want to say one thing, you know, when we, when we think about hey, the, 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 you know, I, 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 I personally don't focus on negativity part of it so much. My, my interest becomes, you know, there is sort of, and I'm not saying there is right about Hegel in that sense. We can always reread a philosopher in a different way and so on and so forth. My interest is just what comes out with that discussion in that sense. The discussion becomes that, I think there is right somewhere, I, I don't remember exactly where, don't quote me on it. But, you know, the point being that Dele writes that, you know, dialectics becomes the last resort of the conquering of the re reactive forces. You know, in, in, in that sense. Uh, the the Dele's critique of Hegel is not that Hegel is wrong, that, that, that dialectics is not a law. The problem with that Dele's that would have it is that exactly when, when Hegel is bringing something which is so universal, that it becomes meaningless. You know, at, uh, exactly, because the problem is for, for Deleuze that once you have a form of knowledge which can be so easily accessible and applied, you cannot find an active subject there. That's the kind of question that, that Deleuze is raising. And, and the problem Deleuze would have is that Deleuze would argue further that it's not a subject that can enjoy. That is what he would say. You know, it's a subject that is laboring. And I'll just sort of build this further here in, in, in that sense. Uh, the dialectics is a, is, a, is a question of a labor. If you go back to Freud here, Freud actually has, Freud and Lacan, if you combine them, you have, they have a three-way distinction. Don't quote me on it. I'm just simplifying a lot of stuff here. But if you think about it, labor comes at the point of ego libido. Right? And object libido becomes this point of overcoming labor. Ego libido is a question of narcissism. At what point you are gaining sexual pleasure from your own self? Isn't it? And Juissance becomes the point or the extreme point of that ego libido in some senses. At, 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 at a point at which your libidal, libidal excess stops working for your own survival because ego libido is for your own survival. But at some point, your ego libido detaches from your own survival and starts functioning through the dead drive as we, as we were discussing. So there's Jewish science, there's ego libido, and then there is love, object libido in some senses. The, 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 you know, Freud says in narcissism, paper love is the um, no, exa exemplary form of object libido because that, and it is in love also a person can sacrifice himself. So it is in Jewish science also you can sacrifice yourself. You are, you, you, you are functioning in your, in, on your own pain and your own negative effect in, in some sense. In love also you can sacrifice yourself. But those, those those two forms of sacrifices are very different, and those that, which is why it is very very antithetical to say that I am passionate about killing myself. There's something wrong about that statement. 
<laughs> you know, it's not that you can't enjoy killing yourself. That is not true. That's not the problem. Problem is that you can't associate the word passion with it. Because there's a fundamentally a distinction between this form of juicance and love. A juicance that you can get from love. There is a juicance in love. But there's a distinction between juicance of this form, where your negative affect sort of gets hooked onto the drive, and the juicance you can get from love. Or the enjoyment you can get from love. So coming back to uh, our discussion on today's, you know, with this, I think one of the things we should ask about when we are trying to ask a the question like, can we know the thing in itself or not? Uh, is that at what point our discussion on these philosophical questions become perverse? At what point are we dealing with perverse knowledges? Knowledges which, which, which you may have them. There's no stopping you from having them in that sense. You may, you can actually know all of the, that stuff, you know, with enough philosophical insight. Uh, but at some point, that knowledge is stop activating itself as real knowledge, as love, and it gets starts getting activated as a perverse knowledge, like you, like the Jewish science of, you know, uh, the societal person. And at, at what point the distinction becomes important for us? I think that is that is that 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 question can become important to us in that conversation between Deleuze and Hegel. That at some point our knowledge does become perverse knowledge in philosophy. For, for 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 most people that would even tune into this, literally every every minute of this would have been perverse. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, it, it can it can it can it can vary from subject to subject. You're actually right. You know, certain people, certain knowledge, certain points of time are much more activated than for other people. The same knowledge can be simply restricting them for movement. That but, is entirely. Uh, but, but to your point, I can feel when that's like when we start veering into like object petita and uh, and the real as it doesn't relate to sort of things that like that I'm more interested in and and I still find I find it really fascinating I talk all day about it but I also start to develop I start to hear a voice that's like you're wasting your life and I'm like <laughs> and then there's an enjoyment it's like yeah I'm just fucking killing time you know and um <laughs> so it's enjoyable but the extent to which is useful uh and not that philosophy needs to be useful but useful in the sense of like is it giving me vitality or is it like whittling my time away, like in a little rabbit hole that, you know, is yeah, exactly. enclosed? And personally, I'm all for perverse pleasures. I enjoy them a lot. I have no issues with them. I, I just, I just, I just want to be honest about what kicks we get from, you know, <laughs> one should be, one should have that, that responsibility for one's own uh, in, the, in, in that sense that you, you should know what is giving you the kick you should not be that subject who thinks he actually wants to kill himself because he's in pain and he's not getting any enjoyment from it you know, as long as you can be honest about okay it does, I get some enjoyment from it that is why I want to kill myself you may still be in the more ethical position to do it than a person who's simply thinking that you know it's all pain it's all drama it's all labor in that sense that is making me so uh, that I, and that and I think that is what is at stake in in the discussion that that philosophy has become a, detached from common life that you're talking about, uh, Daniel. You know that at what point philosophy becomes perverse because it becomes perverse at the point it, that 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 split from the common life sort of happens for us. You know, and, and that's that's the kind I think we can have a discussion. Yeah, thanks. So this is outstanding. Um, so a few things. Absolutely. David Hume's massive concern is when philosophy becomes perverse, because when it becomes perverse, it becomes a massive force of destruction, basically, for him. And it takes people out of common life, et cetera, so forth. What belonging, again, will argue through all the sociologists is also non-philosophical life is perverse. And the only way to avoid the perversion of non-philosophical life is actually with philosophy now. Because what Berger will talk about in um, Human All Them is that the world today is unleashed with philosophical consciousness. Everyone is actually philosophers. Everyone is an existentialist because of the collapse of sociological givens, which is precisely what they're talking about with the collapse of the meaning crisis. But the funny thing is, is the meaning crisis is not a lack of meaning in a nihilistic way. It's an overabundance of meaning. And Mr. Ebert is very good on that. And that is what all those sociologists refer to as the unleashing of philosophical consciousness, mainly Mr. Hume. Like Mr. Hume was so concerned about a government that tried to um, 
that felt like it needed to ground itself in a philosophical concept as opposed to a common life, because when governments ground themselves in philosophical concepts, they become tyrannical because they're unbound. We're defending democracy so we can invade any country that doesn't have democracy. We're defending equality so we can go into any country that doesn't have equality. And he's concerned that philosophy becomes a source not only of perversion, but also totalitarianism and control in different things. So there's this massive David Hume skepticism is not a nihilistic skepticism, but always a check yourself, check your freaking self. And for David Hume, like it would today, the problem is because of the unleashing of philosophical consciousness, you're already always acting according to a philosophy. So the question is like Mr. Barnes with the iconoclast, you're always operating according to an answer to the meta question. So you better be good at it. It's the way I think about it is similar to going to the gym. There is a perverse way of going to the gym, is there not? You're just going to show off, you're over-exercising. Like you see these people that like over-exercise, right? There's like a problem. It's not, it's like, it's no longer about health now. It's about something else, right? And yet at the same time, like not exercising can get, can like give you a heart attack, right? There's like consequences to not exercise. But then if you do the exercise, there's a risk of a perversion. For what has happened for all the sociologists is now that you're in a philosophical world, philosophy is like going to the gym. You basically have to do it. But if you do it, you're always at risk of that perversion because you could go too far in the same way that going to the gym can always lead to a perversion because you go too far, right? So then the question becomes, what is the most efficient manner by which to check and balance ourselves to make sure that this is not just becoming pleasure for pleasure's sake, but it actually has something going on? Now, like you say, Perverse pleasures can be great. Watching Netflix for no purpose, but Netflix can be great. So just because it's a pleasure for pleasure shake does not inherently mean it's bad, but there's always a risk with that because it overfits and that's what you're doing all the time. Um, but the check and balance for philosophy is always bringing it back to the phenomenological. Do you in fact see freak theory as an accurate representation of skinny jeans, as an accurate representation of what occurs with fame and popularity, status, and so on and so forth? If so, there would be reason to think that freak theory is not merely perverse enjoyment, that it has some sort of explanatory power that would be useful for people to live better lives. And you could say, oh, but it's not merely utilitarian. We're not doing it for better. Well, we have to do it for something. And what I mean by better life is you're not getting caught up in needless pathologies. Uh, you know, you are going to have to deal with drama. You are going to have to deal with complexity and problems. The question is like I've been saying, like I was saying, needless disagreement. How do we avoid needless disagreement in these online spaces, right? A lot of philosophy is like, how do you avoid needless or empty explanations of the world in favor of better ones so that you can better position yourself in the world to carry yourself in a manner that avoids unnecessary pathologies so that you can focus on the pathologies that are more constructive to focus on because they're your unique symptoms, right? That Lacan and Zizek and all of them like to talk about. A way to think about it is although someone who turns into the net would be like, those are the most perverse people I have ever freaking seen, right? There's a difference between the person watching the net and the person in the syllogism going through the conceptual mediation. Like we said, going into the formula, right? So the idea is when does coming to the net cease to be something of what works one, which ceases to work th one through conceptual mediation. So they enter the realm of the concept in the science of logic, because that's the place of the self-forgetfulness where freak theory becomes something you don't even thinking about, you just do. Likewise, the realm of the concept is where philosophy is not something you do, you just are. And then you just are that thing in the midst of a world today that is unleashed philosophical consciousness. And because you are that concept as so conceptually mediated, hopefully through the quote unquote syllogism of something like the net, you are not so susceptible to totalitarian and conspiracies, needless drama, or getting lost in high convoluted things that take you away from the ability to drive a fence post into the ground. And so I think that becomes the conceptual mediation and check and balance on oneself to make sure that they do not fall into those things. And that's why I think the concept, which to me is indeed a state of being, being mediated into essence, into concept of a kind of self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness, as Javier and I have talked about, and that's a Timothy Keller term, is a notion of not selfish, where you're always thinking about yourself, or selfless, where you're always thinking against yourself. Self-forget is you just forget yourself. But to reach a state, you just use yourself. You just have an ego. You just use it like your thumb, right? Likewise, philosophy always has to be in service of reaching a place of a kind of philosophical forgetfulness. Because, but that means it has to be willing to die. The antidote to perversion being over perversion is a willingness to 
die. Because otherwise the perversion becomes what? To use Mr. Ebert's language, cancerous. It becomes cancerous. How do you keep perversion be from becoming cancerous? The willingness for it to die, which means you are always working your philosophy to saturate your life. That means bring it in into your life to totally relate to your life in a manner that then has philosophical forgetfulness. And if one is working philosophy to the place of philosophical forgetfulness, then the perverse enjoyment that one may have during the net, during the conversation to get to that place of philosophical forgetfulness, suddenly is flip moment into being a joy that was part of a bigger picture, not merely the philosophical conversation itself. It was the joy on the road to philosophical forgetfulness, not a joy of distraction from the life that we live in, the common life that we live in that we should be willing to die for in the sense of so described. But let me pass it to Javier and Dimitri. You know, Daniel, this is what I've always said with philosophy. I'm like, the, there's always something about the philosopher's question that carries a kind of perverse enjoyment. <laughs> always, always, without without a doubt, it always goes, and it, it definitely happened today, because I think at a certain point, we were laboring a question, and then we just fell into, like, the perverse enjoyment, we're like, the con, the con. I was, I mean, I am not exempt from this at all, <laughs> whatever. I am definitely not exempt from this. <clears throat> but actually, um, just an anecdote, it's funny because in class, people know me as like this guy asking all these deep questions and so on. But then they met me at a party recently and they're like, they like tried to bring it out of me. They're like, yeah, he asked like so deep questions, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm just here to drink and have fun. <laughs> I'm not here to participate in my enjoyment. I'm actually trying to fight my enjoyment currently because I'm really trying not to do this. <laughs> so I actually do I actually do feel that resistance everywhere I go when I meet new people is that I hate I hate fucking small talk I hate it but it's that exact perverse enjoyment that I have of, of wanting to go what I think deeper uh, is deeper questions or whatever um, that's my perverse enjoyment so I keep I keep trying to fight that I don't want it I, I want to ask the dumb questions or the, the banal questions like what's your favorite book to read what's your favorite color <laughs> what what's your major <laughs> you know, like, but yeah th these are just anecdotes i want to add quickly that i think precisely the danger is a philosophical conversation that is not worried about its own perversion like if you are worried about the perversion of that philosophical conversation paradoxically that is evidence that the philosophical conversation is less likely to be perverse what is the problem with the academic discussions they assume their relevance they assume that it matters, right? And so there's no consideration of the possibility of perversion. The possibility of perversion is the negative one that keeps it moving versus there seems to be a difference between a conversation that just keeps going and a conversation that keeps moving. Like there seems to be a difference between that, right? To have it keep moving, the risk of perversion and the resulting anxiety has to be the negative one at the heart of it that you always own. Because if you don't, then you fall into A is A, right, per se. You fall into that auto cannibalism. And um, I want to talk about your cat now and your day and your feelings and stuff. But Dimitri. So um, in Lacan has a discourse theory, right, of four discourses. And there's the discourse of the master. And this would be uh, pre-critical metaphysics. It's all discourse of the master. That's literally how Zizek char characterizes Aristotelian philosophy. And this is like a revolving of chain of signifiers around the master signifier, with, which is pseudo undialectal, undialectalizable. <laughs> so it's 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 an unmoved mover in another in, a, in other words. Well, there's of course an insufficiency in that whole discourse, which reproduces its um, itself in that way through its failure. And there's also the discourse of the hysteric, which is gets closer to truth insofar as it's uh, self-questioning right like the the non-preferred um case of philosophical of like ha doubt having doubt about philosophy as such <laughs> you know being justified um opens up the ability to move and therefore hysteria is super important you know and it's not a it's kind of like um yeah, like Zizek also wants to rehabilitate the notion of hysteria. Now, what's um, what, where it gets weird for me is like the difference between the discourse of the pervert and the discourse of the analyst, especially as it regards to Nietzsche's spirit child, because the discourse 
of um of the analyst actually is is where the analyst is at the position of the object a so basically the analysant is doing free association the analyst might repeat in a particularly significant association back to the analysant and then the analysant is confused and surprised by what it said right it's being confronted with its unconscious and then it gets like and then it slowly starts getting transference for the psychoanalyst right and transference is 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 love which might like manifest as repulsion or attraction which we know you know are in the dialectic always they are not indifference that's their negative uni unity in a sense so um and this this actually allows the hysterical analysant or like the neurotic analysant or the pervert to get more hystericized so it will be able to go through its fundamental fantasy which is ultimately a non-journey like daniel you emphasize again and again now the weird thing is that the discourse of the analyst and discourse of the pervert are the same discourse like structurally they are the same according to the lacanian mathemes and i think there might be also a similarity here between discourse of the pervert and nietzsche's spirit child since it's um it's a self-forgetting wheel that is in a like a, a pure oneness when it with its own becoming as this self-forgetfulness as like the forgetting of the forgetting and me and Michelle were actually talking recently about philosophy being a masculine pursuit. And I asked I asked her, like, do you think that philosophy is a, a masculine pursuit? And like, because there is women who do philosophy, obviously. And you, for example, Alen Alenka Zupancic is a tremendous philosopher, not because she's a, a woman, but she's just a tremendous uh, philosopher, right? So she agreed with me. She said, yeah, it seems to be an a masculine pursuit however it's not the case that there is some like I'm not saying like the women can do philosophy for that uh, reason it's not bound to essence but there is a there like Sloterdijk will actually emphasize there's this importance of transference in philosophy he also Sloterdijk talks about rehabilitating transference um, since it's in the means of, of transference or really like going through the fantasy that we can move the conversation to just the repeating what you're saying. But like by actually doing this, it seems to, to be a, a linear masculine movement into like becoming your own father or like becoming the spirit child or like the overman in a in a sense right because what what is at the end of transference the fact that there is no big other you know there is no one there that's that's the end that's the going through the fantasy yeah i mean gee tom play and i'll note i always find it very interesting that in my experience when you ask men if philosophy is feminine or masculine they say feminine where women tend to say that it's masculine. And there's something there that's very interesting in the character of philosophy. The fact that it has this kind of like calling you to the other. Uh, and, and now I have to expand on that. But like in my experience, like especially if you live in more of a rule or different things, philosophy has a feminine feel, like you're birthing an idea or something like that. Uh, whereas in academia, there's more of an association sometimes with the masculine because of logic and so on and so on. But there's something interesting there I have to think about. Let me pass it to Chitan. Yeah, I just quickly sort of end this by saying, you know, this is actually my Nietzsche paper in many ways, what I've been talking about here. <laughs> but uh, I've been trying to write it. I've not been able to write it for some reason. I'm not able to end it. And I've written like a lot of words in it. But um, just to sort of come back, if you think about it, your question, Daniel, is very right. That, you know, without the perverse side of things, we do not have access to love. Because eventually this split from a subject's link to his own survival brings on one side this direct hooking to dead drive, on the other side it brings it bring to your love. Isn't it? Because at, if, if a subject is only concerned with his own survival, he can't have juicence because juicence involves this gap between between subject and his own mode of survival in, in that sense, his own um, taking care of his own necessity. Because subject can act against his own interests only through juicence. And that minimal gap 
that minimal gap where subject can act against its own interest is necessary to fall in love. So both those things open up because of this gap in the drive itself, where drive itself can directly enter into that drive or get into instincts and, you know, but but that, that minimal gap is important. That subject is that is why Darwin is some you need to you need to update Darwin in that sense because Darwin Darwin's still evolution is linked to you know subjects uh, in you know uh, the survival of the you know and that Darwin itself has an interesting split between species and the individual that that there's a very interesting uh, struggle between species and which, which sort of takes its own shape in evolutionary theory uh, no but that that split when it comes in psychoanalysis you can see it over here. And it's it's really extremely interesting. Um, Chetan, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, what do you think about uh, what I said about the four Lacanian discourses in terms of this perverted enjoyment and especially like the analyst discourse being structurally the same as the perverse discourse? I, I would have to look it up. It's interesting you pointing it out. I would have to look it up. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would it's, have to look it up. Maybe next time we can have to look it up. Well, it's just a note on that. I'm always fascinated, um, and there's a paper in Belonghi again, on why do madness and genius like, like to tango, which is such a cliche notion. But you see, if indeed genius and madness like to always correlate, shouldn't they have an inverse relationship if madness is a lack of rationality, right? But they actually tend to correlate. Like the great example is John Nash, right? Beautiful mind, came up with game theory and all that. Like he had schizophrenia, right? And he claims that the whole reason, and we got to remember, he didn't just do game theory. He did like Raymond, the Raymond hypothesis. He did all sorts of crazy stuff, like hyper genius. Nicole tells us so on and so forth. What's so crazy is he's like, but but guys, the same, like, it's the same process that give me different approaches to the Reinen hypothesis is also what told me aliens are in the CIA, right? So he's like, the same mental ability is what gave me these insights into mathematics, which also created all of these conspiracies and schizophrenia. And there is something fascinating to think about how there is indeed some sort of overlap, isomorphic relationship between what Deleuze will talk about with schizo schizoanalysis and what seems to be the Nietzschean child. Like, is not someone who creates values for themselves as themselves and puts a law around their neck, similar to the person who says, I believe aliens are invading and I don't care who tells me they're not, right? Isn't there similarities there? Well, then what seems to be funny, like, this is the, this is the question. Is that where Hegel's like, yeah, that's why you got to conceptually mediate the, the concept. Like, you got to get to the rhizomatic after the dialectic, not before the dialectic, right? And that, and then I find really interesting, I really enjoyed what you were saying about how Deleuze is like, Hegel, if everything's dialectic, it's a freaking useless concept, dude. Like, what are you telling us? And then this is what's interesting to me. The way you said that, because I keep coming back to Deleuze's take on dialectics, and I'm never sure how to reply, but what you just said really makes a lot of sense to me. Because I think Hegel would look back and be like, Deleuze, if it's everything, then it's everything. And Deleuze is like, no, if it's everything, it's nothing. And it's like that right there matches this weird overlay of the child in the schizophrenic. Like there's an isomathic overlay, which for Hegel, if everything is nothing, then nothing is everything and everything is nothing. Where for Deleuze, it's like, it's useless then. But, the, but Hegel would look back and be like, is gravity useless? It's always an operation. And then Deleuze is like, well, it's always labor then. This is what I think is interesting. It's almost like, again, I'm just free speaking. It's almost like Hegel would be like, the only way you get um, new materialism, rhizomatic life is through labor and in labor. And in fact, if labor is everything, labor becomes joy. Labor actually becomes the expression of the child and it's no longer toil, right? So there's, there's some interesting plays there that might be worth exploring because I think that's really interesting where definitely Hegel's dialectic is not merely, it, it's a, it's like, I, I, like I keep thinking, it's like, he'd be like, it's freaking gravity. It's just a description of how things are, Deleuze. It's not like I chose it. And Deleuze is like, well, you're always working. And, and Hegel's like, I didn't make this universe. I didn't make it. Yeah, you always have to work through the dialect, but I didn't, I didn't make it. So don't yell at me, <laughs> you know? And he's like, how do we work through it? Um, and to me, the other thing that's really interesting, I guess, that I'm also thinking as you're speaking, it's almost like, you know, in that paper, how the absolute 
may move in the absolute choice. I'm, you know, I try to think Lehman Pascal's metaphysics of adjacency with the 99% with Alex Ebert's freak theory. And it's interesting to think that every that the negative one of Lacan is what makes everything the 99% Lehman Pascal talks about, which means metaphysics is always, you know, he uses it like moving or it's a little off, but that's why things are dynamic and alive when he's talking integral theory. And it's interesting to think if that negative one is in fact in all phenomenon, which is what makes them all in of themselves 99%, which is why then the freak theory description is accurate. You can almost think of Lehman, uh, Lacan, and what Freud is doing, and then, and then Ebert, all of which I think is captured in the science of logic, right? Well, all of that would also kind of overlay with, like if we think about what some of the Neoplatonists are saying, like they are saying that everything has a negative one that is its form, which is the source of its vertical causation, which is why it unfolds like it does. And since that negative one, which is the source of its vertical location, vertical causation is never reducible to the phenomenon, reductionism is false. And so when I think about the source of the vertical causation in Neoplatonism as the negative one, which then turns everything into a 99% in Lehman Pascal's language, which then gives them a wave structure following excess and on abscess, which Ebert is talking about, then you can see how you can have a new metaphysics that isn't one susceptible to the naive metaphysics of the past. And you could live this in a new way. You could live this knowing that every single equilibrium or accomplishment you reach in your life will instantaneously generate a new negative one, which then when you experience that, you won't think is evidence that you did something wrong, but that this is just the way life is. And when labor turns out to lead to new labor, which is a funny birth term as well, work and birth, when labor leads to new labor, if you have this metaphysical schema, you won't conclude you did something wrong, but in fact, this is the way of the world. And the question is, how can you so much identify and totally relate with that continual creative labor like Nietzschean's child that you enter philosophical forgetfulness then thus you have mediated the concept. Thus the concept has become you and you are living it in a manner and other people may say it's crazy because there's some sort of isomorphic relationship between the child and the schizophrenic and the delusion sense. You know it's not because you are in the syllogism. You are being mediated by it, not just looking at it on a piece of paper. And though people who see it on a piece of paper may say someone that's crazy, the one who's living it knows that it's worth indeed living. But with that, my friends, I will have to run. This has been a delight. I have really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, friends. Beautiful words, Thank Daniel. You. I love you all. Thank you, Chinchan. Javier, to me, this has been a blast. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Thank you so much.